А що мама? Намагається виходу з рубіжного, в неї паніка. Говорила, прошу тільки не кидати влада. Так, вони в дорозі. Кажуть, що коло на машині йде спокійно, ніхто нікого не переганяє. У мене таке відчуття, ніби це я зараз знаходжуся на її місці. І це я намагаюся з дитиною виїхати з Києва. І ми вас дуже любимо, все цілого повагу. To my wracamy po krótkiej przerwie technicznej. Eksplodowała nam główna maszyna w studiu. Wszystko musieliśmy poustawiać od nowa i siebie, i maszyny, i kable, i kamery. Ale jesteśmy Stanisław Konopo. Przepraszamy za usterki na łączach. Wybaczcie za techniczne niepoładki. My do was powracamy, się prowadzimy lekcję. Зупинилися ми з вами на фільмі «Повернення додому» Гюстава Учицького. Суть пропаганди, де відношення, свідомість наша змінюється тільки через те, що хтось вирішив перекручувати факти так, як йому захочеться. В цьому з'являється романтизація війни. Начебто найкраще, що ти можеш віддати, це своє життя. Начебто... Цінності в ньому ніякої немає. І єдине, що ти можеш бути, це шматком м'яса, просто лежучи під ногами у незрозумілих створінь. Це не має відбуватися так в кінематографі. Цілий світ намагається зробити відношення до війни, намагається змінити нашу свідомість на те, що це жахіття насправді. Протягом останніх восьми років, які українського кінематографу, ми бачимо, як змінювалось наше відношення до війни. Дуже багато фільмів повстало на тему конфлікту з Росією, де показується справжнє її лице. І це показує те, яким насправді має бути війна у свідомості людей. Ще один момент, який... Це достатньо... Практичні речі, які ми бачимо, які ми одразу можемо аналізувати. Але є одна річ, яка не підвладна нашій свідомості одразу. Це дитячі спогади. Не від нас залежить те, якими вони будуть. І Росія заповнила повністю наш культурний простір. І коли лунає, наприклад, якась російська музика, на жаль, це навіює наші спогади. Приємні якісь спогади в більшості випадків. Звичайно, що це створило певний теж культурний кордон в нашій країні. І ми почали називати єдину країну, ділити її на західну і на східну. Що неправильно, Україна єдина, є її частини. І для того, щоб теж зрозуміти взагалі, чим є ця маніпуляція, чому так... Безпардонно, вона змінила своє сприйняття. Я вам назву три цитати з українського кінематографу кінця ХХ століття і три цитати з радянського кіно. Просто зробіть для себе висновок, що ви пам'ятаєте краще. Перша українська. Дайте мені його хоча б за горло подержати. Ну і в приклад. В порівняння радянська. Штірліц, я вас попрошу остатися. Друга українська. Сім'ю не можна зруйнувати з боку. Вона назавсіди розпадається зсередини. І з'являється російська. Кажеться, вечір перестає бути томним. Можливо, ця українська вам щось нагадає. Про нього люди казали, що він як Бог. Його боялися. 
але потребували всі. Це три дуже важливих фільми з нашої культури, з нашої історії, які ми, по суті, не знаємо. А ось і остання радянська. Перепрошую про ненормативну лекцію, лексику, але це цитата. Сучка, ти крашена. Ну, почему же крашена? Это мой натуральный цвет. Цікаво, что я переконаний в том, что первые три цитаты украинские вам не нагадали ни про что. А это культовые фильмы из нашей истории. Причем, как показывает практика, найкраще людиною маніпулювати в таком жанре, как легкая комедия. Потому что это как раз является суть, суттю цієї лекції. Кіно перед сном. Це момент, коли ти приходиш з роботи, коли ти хочеш розслабитись. Мозок був цілий день заповнений інформацією. І зараз тобі просто потрібно щось на фоні, щось, якийсь шум. І люди придумали щось таке, як легка комедія, хоча насправді такого жанру не існує, є комедія, а легка, але суть його зрозуміла, що ми намагаємося вкласти в це слово. І всі. Цитати, які я згадував з радянського кінематографу, вони саме пов'язані в більшості випадків з легкими комедіями. Того, що людина приходить додому, не думає про те, що вона буде собі включати, того, що вона хоче просто розслабитись. І цей шум на свідомість нашу починає записувати те, що якийсь егоїст хоче, щоб ви думали. Про саму радянську, школу радянського кіно я говорити не буду. Вона в будь-якому випадку мала бути сильною для того, щоб контролювати людські думки. І тут постає запитання, так якщо це сильна школа, чому ми не можемо на ній вчитися, чому ми не можемо щось з неї виносити, чому вона такою поганою являється? Давайте з вами розберемося. Загалом радянська школа перейшла в російську, і ми бачимо на сьогоднішній день, що, які шоу, які фільми вони знімають. Я не говорю про буквальну пропаганду, де просто прямим текстом вам говорять, що ви маєте думати. Люди... Це зовсім інший рівень. Це, коли вам напряму говорять те, що ви маєте думати, це відноситься до того, з чого я почав лекцію. До емоцій, агресії, і для... направлено на людей, які думати просто не вміють. А є моменти, які говоряться жартома, невзначай. Особливо це жахливо для, люд... для дітей, які ще не встигли зрозуміти, не, не, не встигли навчитися рефлексувати. Одним з таких прикладів, які в'єда... в'єдається мені постійно в пам'ять, це шоу, не шоу, а серіал «Інтерни», де нам одразу диктують, як ми маємо сприймати чорношкірих. Серія ця заключалася в тому, що найрозумніший в лапках персонаж, інтерн, отримує пацієнта чорношкірого. І вони, він до нього звертається, намагається звертатися англійською, ламаною, в нього нічого не виходить, але пацієнт йому відповідає російською. І о диво, ці двоє намагаються довести, хто із них більше русський, п'ючи горілку. Суть в тому, що протягом всієї серії він намагається принизити іншу расу. Хоча начебто і жартума, і начебто ви можете сказати, Стас, ну ти розповідаєш якусь діч, така культура. Але подумайте тільки про дітей, які дивляться цю серію, які не мали стичності з іншою расою, просто через своє географічне положення. Вони потрапляють в майбутньому вже дорослими, начебто свідомими людьми, в суспільство, де, де зустрічаються з цією расою. Про що вони починають думати? Починає працювати наше несвідоме. І вони згадують серію інтернів. Це повний бред того, що єдине, з чим вони можуть пов'язати серію інтернів, це з тим, що це не така людина, як ти. Коли я рився в цитатах, Радянського кіно я потрапив не на одну з цитат стосовно іншої раси. І всі вони говорилися жартома, невзначай. І придратися до цього якось конкретно не до кінця можна. Але суть залишається однією тією ж самою. 
Вони не сприймають іншу расу взагалі, для них це не люди. Послухайте тільки одну з цитат. «Єрунда, негри їдять людей, люди – це їх національна піща». Це фільм «Корона російської імперії» і «Лісного неуловімої». Я думаю, цей момент не потребує коментарів. Правда в тому, що кіно створює персонажів, яких, на яких ми хочемо рівнятися. Кіно відкидає всі моменти, які в житті незручні. Воно потроює наші плюси в поведінці і потроює так само наші, наші мінуси. Я, знаєте, прослухавши один мінус кінематографу в маніпуляції, особливо з того моменту, що кожен, хто створює кіно, намагається маніпулювати твоєю свідомістю, потім піднімається тема романтизації всього негативного, що з'являється в картинах, з'являється питання якихось таких несвідомих речей, і, я думаю, нормально, нормальною реакцією було б, Якщо ви запитаєте, типу, Стас, ну ти гониш, ну це фігня. Того, що значить, ми нічого з цим зробити не можемо. Можливо, ти нам щось запропонуєш. Так, я маю пропозицію для вас. Як можна з цим боротися? Не пропозицію, а просто нормальний, тверезий підхід. Це потрібно виховувати звичку. Звичку аналізувати те, що ти побачив. Таку звичку виховує авторське кіно, андерграундне кіно. Кіно, яке не, не сильно просувається, як, як голівудська легка комедія. Це кіно в більшості випадків ставить дуже багато запитань. Особливо запитань для людини, яка звикла дивитися легкі комедії. Того, що це мас-медіа. І це нормально, що наша свідомість автоматично вибирає щось легше, ніж не хоче задавати собі запитання. Але що таке звичка? Звичка – це просто постаратися включити один раз, другий раз, третій раз. І ти починаєш звикати. Ти перестаєш сміятися з артхаусу. Ні, є, звичайно, артхаус, з якого можна посміятися. Але ти починаєш розуміти кінематограф трошки інакше. І не, не сам так кінематограф, як життя того, що це впливає на те, як твій мозок починає працювати. Це такий ж саме твій м'яз, який потребує тренування. Мінус в тому, що я знаю, що ви цього не зробите. Більшість з вас не зробить цього і не почне виховувати собі цю звичку. Але в мене є для вас інша пропозиція. Поєднуйте це з корисним. Поєднуйте, тобто не з корисним, а корисне поєднуйте з приємним. Кіра Муратова, неймовірніша режисерка, фільм якої ми сьогодні будемо дивитися, вона заслуговує на келих вина протягом свого фільму. Обговорюйте те, що ви побачили з друзями. Не бійтесь своїх думок. Чим більше ви будете про це говорити, тим більше ви будете зацікавлені в тому, що ви бачите. Переглядайте це з людьми, з якими, можливо, ви хочете з цього посміятися. Це теж нормально. Бо якщо ви цього не розумієте, але згодом звичка переростає в корисну. І ми зовсім інакше сприймаємо інформацію, якою нами намагаються маніпулювати. Так як ми сьогодні вже подивилися... Другий трейлер, який буде офіційно опублікований в мене на сторінці, на сторінці Клаймаксу нашого фільму. Я трошки розкажу вам про фільм. Чим являється він взагалі в українській культурі, чим являється він амбітно в світовій культурі. Тому що потрібно зараз усвідомити кожному з вас, особливо людям, які займаються культурою, те, що зараз наш час, ми змінюємо історію. Пройшов рік війни повномасштабного вторгнення. Ми дуже багато поклали жертв, і зараз ми можемо змінити, змінити просто, просто хід подій, історії. Подивіться, як, на які топи вийшла Україна. Стосовно українського кінематографу, в 20 столітті ми увійшли на світовий рівень своїм жанром, який не повторює ніхто. 
це поетичне кіно. Поетичне кіно насправді достатньо складне. І воно не набуло своєї популярності по дуже багатьом причин. І однією з цієї причин була, звичайно, що таке тимчасове непорозуміння Радянський Союз і тимчасове непорозуміння Росія. Воно все знищувалося і забувалося, хоча мало би рекламуватися. Але протягом того, як воно знищувалося, глядач починав звикати до лінійного і простого логічного сюжету. Фільм «Якти» поєднує те, чого очікує глядач, і поєднує наше минуле. Через поетику, через логічний хід подій, він розповідає про внутрішній стан українців в перший день війни. Але через поетику, через асоціації, він розповідає глибші відчуття. І це наша ціль. Ціль підняти поетичне кіно на новий рівень, повернути його в нашу культуру. Подумайте тільки, ми єдина країна, яка це кіно створювала. Звичайно, що воно вплинуло на майбутніх кінематографістів. Ми бачимо, що будь-яка знана американська школа має обов'язково переглядати фільм «Тіні забутих предків». Зараз дуже багато про це говориться, і суть в тому, що ми не до кінця можемо це розуміти. В більшості випадків люди, які пов'язані з кінематографом, його переглядають. А просто суспільство, вони хочуть легких комедій. Але ми можемо делікатно це повернути. І я дуже сподіваюся, що фільм «Як ти» стане таким... Одним з перших кроків до повернення поетичного кіно. Чорноброві, дякую за вашу увагу, дякую, що ви були з нами, дякую за ваше терпіння і перепрошую ще раз за те, що у нас обірвався стрім. Зараз ми, у вас буде можливість подивитися тизер до фільму «Якти», який піднімає ще одне важливе питання нашої ролі і відчуття, коли ти не знаходишся на передовій. Дякую за вашу увагу. Дякуємо. Я вирішив повертатися. Коли? Як не швидше. Потрібно якось дістати влада з Києва, він там на позняках, виїхати поки не може. Казав, що просидів весь цей час в метро, спав на підлозі. Казав, що все болить. А що мама? Намагається виходу з рубіжного, в неї паніка. Говорила, прошу тільки не кидати влада. Тому не знаю як, але по приїзду буду записуватись в тероборону. Спочатку треба вирішити, як дістати влада. Скажи мені чесно, ти впевнений? Чувак, через 10 років нас питатимуть, яку роль ми зіграли у цій війні. Я не хочу ховатися чи тікати, коли в мене є можливість бути корисним. А корисним я можу бути тільки там.
Dziękujemy, wracamy za chwilę. Mały stand-by i przygotowanie do następnej części programu. Jest już z nami pani profesor. W końcu jesteśmy dzisiaj w szkole od rana. Zostawiam was na razie z Nuarem. Słuchajcie, jeżeli macie pytania, to można wrzucać pytania na czacie i do Stanisława i w kontekście kolejnych rozmów i wykładów i prezentacji będziemy się starali odpowiadać. Jeżeli nie dzisiaj, to na pewno kiedyś. Bo my dzisiaj jesteśmy zderegulowani, ale jest to bardzo dobry stan takiego zasiewu wątków, motywów, tematów, których jest bardzo dużo i bardzo <grywa> intensywnie je sygnalizujemy psychofizycznie na własnych ciałach. Głowy małe.
Pierwszego efiru Ukraina TV Secik, który został nagrany i wypuszczony na żywo w pierwszym naszym wystąpieniu. Najbardziej eksperymentalnym, bo sami nie wiedzieliśmy i nie wiedziałyśmy, co z tego wyniknie. Wynikło to, że jesteśmy tutaj dzisiaj. A żeby zrobić sobie jeszcze jedną wycieczkę i złapać oddech przed kolejnym wykładem, który już za chwilę i mam nadzieję dyskusją też między osobami, które są tutaj z nami, ale też z wami na czacie. Będziemy zaglądać i pozdrawiać i szukać pytań i odpowiedzi też u was w hybrydowej kondycji. Polecimy sobie jeszcze na krótką wycieczkę, słuchajcie. Trailer drugiego sezonu Ukraina TV z końca sierpnia, początku września. Czemu? also an issue in our society that we have a, a lot of anger. How to think non-sovereignty of the present as a state one could flourish in. Not a return to Eden, Not one's proud moment of glory. Not even one's own. Not even one's own. Not even one's own. Not even one's own. There is something like art for art and something like art for money. You know, and I, I, I can't call this uh, thing I believe a true only, underground. I believe only uh, for art for people. We don't have enough time, we don't have enough power, we just can do uh, best what we can this do is in our this power. time. In this because uh, in the past we can do anything, in future it's something that we can also not have something physical. Uh, but the present is the only one uh, moment we can make something really uh, physical and truly something true. A z nami w studiu jest profesor Ewa Bal z Katedry Performatyki Uniwersytetu Jagiellońskiego, która badawczo, ale też wydaje mi się, że osobiście zajmuje się wątkami, które my tutaj bardzo często przeżywamy i jest nam potrzebna wszystkim też pewnego rodzaju wiedza wypracowywana w kontekście e, tych relacji, które się dzieją, tych cielesnych, tych e, psychofizycznych, e, do których chyba nie do końca byliśmy przygotowani, e, jesteśmy przygotowani, 
I tutaj nie mówię o osobach z Ukrainy, ale mówię też o osobach z Polski, bo wydaje mi się, że to kłącze i te połączenia i te e, z jednej strony procesy budowania jakiejś takiej... E, nie wiem, czy w ogóle słowo tożsamość jest tutaj na miejscu, ale jakiejś takiej właśnie hybrydowej e, konst, ko, konstrukcji e, jest e, czymś, co... My doświadczamy i zaprosiliśmy Ewę, żeby pomogła nam też pewne rzeczy zobaczyć lepiej, steoretyzować i zainspirować też do dalszych działań i do też rozmowy. Mam nadzieję. Oddaję Ci głos. Dziękuję Romku za zaproszenie. To dla mnie duża przyjemność być tutaj z Wami tego dnia czyli w rocznicę napaści, pełnoskalowej napaści Rosji na Ukrainę. Zdecydowałam, że będę mówić po angielsku. To jest takie taktyczne rozwiązanie z mojej strony i chciałabym dzięki temu postawić się trochę obok tego, co będę mówiła. So I switch into English now and I start by reading because English is not my mother tongue and I feel much more comfortable uh, with a piece of paper. So um, there is no denying that one of the paradoxical and unintended effect of Russia's full-scale assault on Ukraine has been that almost the entire Western world has turned the eye on contemporary Ukrainian drama, its theater and cinema particularly on those artists who had already spoken about this ongoing war with Russia on numerous occasions since 2014, but were basically not heard or listened to outside the context of their home culture. After the 24th February, however, many theaters, not only in Poland, but in most countries of the European Union, began to organize performative readings of plays by authors such as Natalia Vorosbyt, Natalka Bloch, Pavlo Aire, Olga Maciupa, and many others as a gesture of solidarity with Ukraine. Usually, translations of Ukrainian dramas into local languages like Polish, French, German, and English were used for this purpose and read by local actors. An exception was the reading of Natalia's blog play Through the Skin, Chris Skiru, um, Przez Skórę, translated by Anna Korzeniowska Bichun at the Drama Laboratory, which featured Oksana Czerkaszyna, an actress from Kharkiv who works permanently in Poland and plays in three languages, Ukrainian, Polish, and Russian. So for me, this turn to Ukrainian drama and the question of its translation and performative readings is the starting point for thinking about a phenomenon I would call the expanding of the field of linguistic recognition. This expanding, which refers directly to Judith Butler concept in the notes of the performative theory of gatherings, aims to draw attention to the benefits of the hybridization of the leading language in culture, as well as to the consequences of the emergence of minority languages, which like the precarious bodies of migrants in Judith Butler book, Precarious Life, require our special attention and care. But um, how to understand this relationship between language and the body? Well, the issue of corporeality or embodied presence as a strategy for enhancing the subjectivity of precarious beings only seemingly seems separate from the issue of the language. The Ukrainian language, which today is the language of subjects in the particular position of the war refugee, is indissolubly linked to the body. As Jana Merzon has pointed uh, when 
researching the so-called dramaturgy of authentication and migrant bodies and the functions of translation in theater, language bears the hallmarks of the materiality of the subject on an equal basis with the body. This raises in me the question of how, in a foreign cultural context, to reconcile the subject's desire to be understood and heard with the need to give up their own tool of subjectivity, which is undoubtedly the native language. In this lecture, therefore, I would like to look at the phenomenon of translation in the context of decolonization process and reflect on whether it is really a case that the gesture of transferring texts and representations from one culture to another through translation is always beneficial from the mobilized subjects, for example, for people coming from countries where war is being waged. In other words, I would like to share my doubts about the efficacy of supporting cultures and communities and precarious subjects through translation and reflect on the possibilities for them to speak in such a way that they can indeed effectively build their subjectivity in the dense mesh of multicultural gazes but saving their language. The examples I will refer to are mainly from Poland, I mean from Polish readings of Ukrainian dramatic texts and performances with the participation of Ukrainian artists. I am referring to the performance Lvov ne oddame, Lviv ne vidamo, uh, uh, or Leopoli we don't give up, directed by Katarzyna Szyngiera at the Wanda Siemaszkowa Theatre in Rzeszów back in the 2018. Then the reading of the play Through the Skin, Chris Szkiru, uh, uh, Przez Skórę by Natalia Bloch at the Drama Laboratory uh, in Warsaw in May 2022. And the performance Chris Szkiru based on the same play by Natalia Bloch, but from the Oko Theatre in Lviv, directed by Agata Dichka and featuring Ukrainian actress Halena Reba, which was performed at the Supernova Theatre in Krakow in January 2023. I would like to begin my reflections by recalling the well-known play in the Polish cultural context, directed by by Katarzyna Szyngiera, entitled uh, Lwów nie oddamy, Lwów nie wydamy. Uh, Szyngiera, back in 2018, wanted to denounce the process of typici typifying the newcomer immigrant actor by Polish audience and culture through an attempt to fit her into the cognitive framework of the so-called so typical Ukrainian woman. To this end, Shingera invited a Ukrainian actress from Kharkiv, Oksana Cherkashina, to participate in the play and cast her in a somewhat perverse role. The play begins with a scene during which the pleasant chat of some somewhat bored Polish actors is disrupted by the sudden arrival of Cherkashina who impetuously stands on the platform, crossing the stage, pretending to be the Polish-Ukrainian border, dressed in a fleshy fork scarf and stocked with several boxes of Ukrainian cigarettes. This, of course, is a pure stereotype of an Eastern European female mi migrant. But Cherkashina, right at the beginning of the play, she doesn't care about her bad Ukrainian accent in Polish language because it will be compensated for the Polish audience by the Polish subtitles. In fact, the subtitles appear immediately on the screen above her. Well, Remek, would you please play the first video? <laughs> Dzień dobry, szanowni państwo. Jestem Oksana, jestem aktorką z Ukrainy i najpierw chciałam powiedzieć państwu dziękuję. Dziękuję. Dziękuję, że zaprosili mnie tutaj, że zagrała dla was rolę, prawda? 
prawdziwej Ukrainy, gdzie jestem no, po prostu super szczęśliwa. Jestem szczęśliwa, nawet nie zwracałam z uwagi na ten przykry epizodzik, gdzie my z moimi kolegami z Polski zagrali dla nas scenę o wyśleniu Ukraińców zbiniowej, ale nic mi nie szkodzi. Zadanie mi gitarę, ale nic mi nie szkodzi. A szanowni Państwo, wiem, że jest się niedobrze rozmawiam po polsku, ale proszę się nie martwić, będą napisy. Proszę napisy. No. No i teraz, szanowni Państwo, zobaczcie, co będzie, kiedy nasza bohaterka, czyli prawdziwa Ukrainka, czyli ja, spróbuję wracać do swojej ukochanej Litki, czyli do Polski, czyli do Unii Europejskiej, po prostu do pierwszego świata. Hejka, kochani. Okay, thank you. And uh, right after that, secondly, having thus cross the symbolic Polish border, she gets a script from one of the Polish actors of a role to, to, to learn, the role of typical Ukrainian woman that she's going to play in front of the Polish audience. Naturally, the character played by Czerkaszyna immediately rebels against the cognitive frame assigned to her in this, this way, since it directly threatens her sense of subjectivity. She provocatively dismantles this existing Polish superior gaze on the social position of Ukrainian migrants in Poland as alleged chipped labor, saying that not only will Poles um, now have to get used to the presence of Ukrainians in Biedranka shops and on building sites, but precisely in their presence on the stages of Polish theatre. Would you please uh, send the second video? <laughs> Skoro już przyjechałeś, proszę bardzo, scenariusz. Dziękuję bardzo, dziękuję. Szanowni Państwo, wiem, że w Polsce już dużo Ukraińców na budowach, w biedronkach, w fabrykach. A teraz, proszę bardzo, będę jeszcze jedna, ale w Teatrze Polskim. Dziękuję. Dziękuję. Co, widziałeś to? Chodź, chodź. Co tu jest? Ty przestań, ale to się powie. Thank you. So, um, Shingera performance, it is worth emphasizing, triggers a discussion on guest otherness, gość inności, host inności, host inności, ale host inności, and hospitality in theater, which has, which has had a long tradition in those countries, including Western Europe and America, which have been working much longer than Poland in the environment of multicultural societies marked by class, racial, and economic inequalities. This is because a new perspective opens up for us to construct multi-ethnic and multilingual theater companies in which actors as well as other theater workers would bring their own subjectivity as people coming from different backgrounds, cultures, speaking different languages, both mm -hmm. minority, native, and foreign languages learned mm -hmm. with a different mm -hmm. accent. The arrival in Poland of actors and artists from Ukraine fleeing the world today can only accelerate this process. Well, five years have passed from the 2018, from the last uh, performance that I uh, played for you. So I would like to ask myself, has this opportunity been really captured by Polish theater? Well, the best answer is always it depends. The first performative readings of Ukrainian plays about the war concern texts written before the outbreak of full-scale war. And I believe that the organizers of these readings, using existing translations of these plays, uh, wanted above all to show that they were in solidarity with the victims of the Russian onslaught at that they had good intentions. 
However, as Jana Merzon points out, quoting Judith Butler, the concept of good intention needs to be interrogated because it's often in it often initiates problematic representational tactics, especially if its subject matter is the victimized or suffering. One's need to recognize the ambiguity of a good intention and the tension between giving the other a voice and the potential for his, her dehumanization through representation. Many productions of performance activism create the circumstances of an artistic encounter, estrangement, and voyeurism. As uh, Cox and Zeruya argue, the excessiveness of representation does not rely on the strategies of recognition. It often capitalizes on the workings of a gaze. We see the migrant as a victim. We sympathize, we empathize. I will try to show this process of dehumanization, or in other words, fetishization, can also be reached in translation strategies, despite the good intentions of both the translators and the organizers of the readings. In the performance, which was shown on the stage of the Dramatyczny Theater with participation of Polish actresses and not uh, and as, I, as far as I seem, the only Ukrainian actress <laughs> in Poland, I mean, Oksana Czerkaszyna again. <laughs> the organizers used the existing Polish translation of Anna Kozeniewska Bichun of the play of, by Natalia Bloch, the Ukrainian author, uh, Chris Shkiru, who uh, especially came from Kiev to Warsaw to stage a Polish reading of her own play. And Oksana Czerkaszyna, who performs on stage, read the Polish translation from a sheet of paper, as I am doing now. So let's see a short excerpt from this reading. Would you please play the third video, please? A ja na to, a jakie to znów SKK? Przecież nawet nie kaszle, mam się nieki na nodze, więc to pewnie jakieś problemy z krwią. Ale internistka długo zapisywała coś na kartce, a potem podniosła oczy i powiedziała, że SKK to znaczy skóra koloru khaki. SKK to znaczy skóra koloru khaki. Z powodu wojny przebywa pani w ciągłym stresie, dlatego Skóra zaczęła przybierać kolor khaki. Hmm. A ponieważ mamy do czynienia z epidemią, w dodatku bardzo zaraźliwą, proponuję, by poszła pani do szpitala. Nic nie rozumiem. Nic nie zrozumiałam. Siedziałam i patrzyłam na nią, jakby była niespełna rozumu. <śmiech> Jakie do kolery kolor khaki? Jaka wojna? No jaka wojna? Uciekliśmy przed wojną trzy lata temu i od tego czasu nie mamy żadnej wojny. Wojna jest w Donbasie i to nie wszędzie. Skąd niby miałby się wziąć ten mój stres? Nie rozumiem. Podpisałam dokument, że się nie zgadzam na hospitalizację, na grzybami w szpital, ja z kim dzieci muszę zostawić. Poza tym uważałam, że leżenie w szpitalu z powodu trzech plam na nodze to realnie głupota. I w ogóle głupota jest to wszystko, co ona mi tu opowiadała, jak wojna może stać się wirusem, który wnika przez skórę i boli. Wojna jest tam, na wschodzie, to biznes, to oczywiście śmierć, poty, krew, ale ja z dziećmi jestem tu przecież bezpieczna. Okay, thank you. Um, so I began to wonder, watching this video, who its organizer, organizers actually wanted to address in the first place? Whose gays wanted to privilege? In the footage, it is clear that an additional communication 
obstacle was put in front of Cherkashina. As a Ukrainian, uh, she had to read, read in Polish a text by her compatriot, Natalia Blok, which is essentially a monodrama by a Ukrainian woman about this psychosomatic illness of her body caused by her wartime experiences. Reading a text not in your own language, as I'm doing today in front of you, speaking in English, regardless of relative fluency, is always less com comfortable than speaking in your mother tongue, and even worse, when you have to use this language to talk about your own suffering or the suffering of people close to you. It is less comfortable, even when the languages come from the same group and are similar, like, such as Polish and Ukrainian. But I'm giving a lecture to you today in English, mainly to reach a larger audience, and above all, I am not speaking in emotion about my experience of war. I am nevertheless keeping a certain psychological distance from the subject of my lecture. After all, I am not the protagonist, unlike the Ukrainian actors at the Polish reading of Natalia Bloch's play. So, Oksana Cherkashina was not only cast in the role of a Ukrainian woman to testify with her presence, language, and body to the suffering of her home homeland, but this suffering itself, externalized in the body as patches on the skin, is the subject of the play. And it is the subjectivity of the suffering that, in my opinion, should come first, rather in Ukrainian or possibly with Polish subtitles. Unfortunately, in this case, the Polish audience, the requirement of the Polish language, and the over-reading principle of universal intelligibility in the language of the dominant culture came first, instead of the materiality of the language of the precarious subject. Well, um, Paweł Wodziński wrote about this violence of language in his essay on guest otherness, gościnności, hostinnosti, as follows. Our world has turned out to be exterminationally inhospitable and at the core of our world is the experience of the annihilation of the other. Therefore, the encounter with the other requires a fundamental restraint, among other things, a renunciation of the violence that my language, which is Polish, the dominant language in Poland, brings to the encounter. How then we can avoid such forms of unintentional oppression of the dominant culture and not completely abandon the need for the actors, the bodies of migrants, the bodies of war victims, to communicate with the audience in a way that <clears throat> is also comprehensible to them. I will show this with the example of a very simple procedure. The inversion of the relationship between the actor's stage language and the translation inserted in the subtitles. A few months after the reading of a series of Ukrainian plays at the Drama Laboratory in Warsaw, a performance of Chris Shkiru, based on the same drama by Natalia Blok, was shown on the stage of Supernova Theatre in Kraków in January this year, but created by an artist from the Oko Theatre in Lviv, in Leopoli. Okay. The performance was a monodrama performed this time in Ukrainian, by Ukrainian actress Helena Ryba with Polish subtitles prepared on the basis of the same translation by Anna Korzeniewska Bichun. Unfortunately, I do not have the recording of this performance, so you have to believe me. Uh, on 
words what I'm talking about, okay? So the performance begins with a scene in which a naked, curled up woman, illuminated by the faint light of a spotlight in the surrounding darkness, slowly recites in Ukrainian the first words of the play about her son, bringing a questioner from school in which it was necessary to write down whether a child and his mother suffered from a strange skin disease of unknown origin. The woman that tells of her wartime experience of fleeing the separatist occupied Donbass, of living in a foreign city, of the strange illness affecting her body, as well as, as the bodies of many people she knows who react similarly to the experience of war. The audience could therefore fo follow the materiality of the Ukrainian language and body on the real stage in real time, supported subtly, subtly in the lexical la layer by, by subtitles in Polish projected above the stage. Importantly, by listening to the actress actresses Ukrainian language, the Polish audience had the opportunity to look at their own language from a certain distance through the eyes and ears of the other. In other words, expanding the landscape of recognition of the Polish language allows one's own dominant language to be alienated, to be seen in a new guise not so much as Polish pronounced with a foreign accent, which can sometimes also be an effective strategy for expanding the field of, recog of linguistic recognition, but as Ukrainian similar to Polish yet different. In fact, Similar efforts have already been made by some European directors, such as Milo Rau, working in Ghent, in Belgium, who makes it clear in his manifesto that a multi-ethnic ensemble allows one to, took at, to look at oneself, one's own cultural background and language, and established cognitive habits from the point of view of the other and thus to recognize, as if it, what Wojcicki would say, the host in the other. A hospitality understood as guest otherness would not only serve the moralistic and boastful exaltation of the host as one who mercifully welcomes those in need under his roof, but above all, it would bring a fundamental cognitive benefit to Polish, Polish culture, burdened with monoethnic and monolingual habits. To be able to look at oneself through the eyes of the other, then, is the starting point for ne negotiating not only ad hoc interpersonal encounters with newcomers and citizens, but also a further reaching opportunity to decolonize our monotonal knowledge. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. You have questions. Uh, the microphone uh, is uh, circulating uh, now. Uh, it's free. The microphone is free. Let's say like okay. that. I just wanted I just wanted to say that one of the most frustrating scenes for me uh, in lectures is the part when somebody asks to uh, ask some questions to students. Uh, it's I feel like you know uh, I feel stressed, uh, but uh, I was uh, studying linguistics in university, uh, but I was not studying uh, Slavic languages. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I was studying deeply Ukrainian languages, uh, Ukrainian language, uh, and uh, I just wanted to ask you, maybe you know, um, talking about. Um, 
uh, talking about Ukrainian language, how do you personally, you, you know, like how would you describe it, or maybe uh, uh, some few words that uh, during uh, uh, your your life you would like, you know, um, look into the past and uh, um, make some retrospective thoughts and um, combine it into a few words. Uh, it's very interesting, like uh, in general. And another one uh, question, but a bit later. <laughs> well, um, well, for me, Ukrainian, it's not uh, a language like any other. Uh, well, uh, let's say that I rediscovered it because uh, my family uh, used to live in the Ukrainian territory before the Second World War. So my grandmother, great-grandmother uh, uh, lived in Kolomea, in uh, Frankivska Oblast. Uh, and my um, uh, grandfather and great-grandfather uh, was from Podole, Podilia. <laughs> so uh, as far as I know, they were they, they knew Ukrainian. They were Polish, but they used to speak Ukrainian. And we both know that before the Second World War, you know, the cities in the present territory of Ukraine were populated by different ethnic groups and lived together, probably not accordingly, I mean, not in very good relationship, we, we don't have to idealize it. But they knew their languages. I'm pretty sure they, that my, uh, my family used to speak fluently uh, Ukrainian. But, um, so, so, uh, so, so I, I, I'm really uh, feel that it is, this language is something that I uh, lack that uh, there is a part of a history of my family that I would, would like to reconstruct because obviously there were no transmission of Ukraine through the generations. So, so it, this is the one thing. And the other is that starting, when I started to learn Ukraine, I'm not fluent in Ukrainian. Uh, I, I'm just at the level B1, which is, you know, basic communication. I understand quite perfectly, but, uh, um, but I need some more time to start to speak it fluently. But it was marvelous because um, I don't know if you have the same feeling studying uh, foreign languages. We are always being sad that you have to know English. You have to know uh, Western languages. So the first lang foreign language you learn, it's, it, it, it's living in, in Central Eastern Europe will be English, will be French, will be, I don't know, Italian. My first foreign, foreign language was English, then Italian, and I don't know, Spanish, f French, and so on. Because n nobody uh, re really realized, and we in Polish, I mean, very few people, would f think that, oh, why don't, don't we learn Ukrainian? It's our neighbor. Or why don't we learn Slovakian? It's, you know, from the family of Slavic languages, which, which are so close to us. Yeah. yeah. That is quite an uh, interesting part of the, you know, the international language, because uh, first of all, we've got one, one of the most biggest uh, reasons why English became so popular. And this, this cultural influence, because there was also the possibility that Russian can be the international language because of the World War II. But thanks God to the culture that in England and in America was very popular that days, it became more, even those people who were going out from Germany, such scientists, for example, they were changing their language to English because that was the part of opportunity. And now we have English, and that's first thing that you learn, as you say. But um, there should be something 
that will influence your choice to learn the language of your neighbor. Today, mostly, people don't want to do anything if they don't have a reason. Unfortunately, we've got a reason today is war because it's, like you say, it's um, kind of restarting, re learning that one more time, understanding that again. But uh, I guess if not war, not a lot of things can, can make us to learn neighbor's language. The same with the Ukrainians who come to Poland to work. That is kind of social and economical part that influences us to learn Polish language. But it's cool that, as we said uh, at the beginning, that the war is the part that influences culture. Mm -hmm. So language will goes on. Yeah, you're perfectly right. I would even, let's say, develop your concept, if I may, because um, what you're talking about is a kind of a um, Western-oriented, uh, I don't know if it's good um, or bad phenomenon, because I suppose that Central Eastern Europe has always been looking at the West uh, as a cultural model and, as you say, economic um, opportunity. But in my age, I don't believe this is something that, that we benefit from, that we directly, I suppose that uh, we can uh, make a treasure of our regional languages and cognitive position and to uh, somehow, I don't know, it's like you've been talking about the uh, Ukrainian cinema, so may, make it a value, make it a value. I, I know it's hard because English is overwhelming, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it, heritage of British colonialism and economic new colonialism. So it is obvious, but what I am trying to do in my little field of interest and work at university is exactly to, you know, turn the gear t towards the East, uh, because we, I, I believe that we have some a certain experience in this part of the world that other nations and countries don't have, that we from this part of the world see certain things better, we know them better, and we have obviously this experience of Russian, uh, Russian exp um, imperialism, but this is uh, um, the reason why we know the danger that comes from you know, this kind of imperialism. So we can speak about it. We can share our uh, experience of this kind of imper imperialism. We can, uh, I don't know, um, awake other people and make them understand the risk that, uh, that comes from, I don't know. Yeah. That is right. Uh, the culture gives that opportunity, that's true. And the thing is that history of humanity shows us that culture could sell some other, cult uh, some other, some other culture to the worldwide only because of this, uh, of its, um, uh, sorry, I forget the word in English, uh, the um, tina, the, 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 pr the price of that and um, the quality also, because that is the thing you see, the, the let's, let's call it uh, project, mm -hmm. that is the way you see the project. If you believe in it, if you understand and feel that, you can sell that for the worldwide. Yeah. We've got such kind of great example of the uh, temporary world, temporary culture, about the postmodernism in, in literature, especially now in cinema, is the uh, novels by Haruki Murakami. That is the Japan uh, author who is selling worldwide because of the, the way he sees the plot. 
the United States selling us the same postmodernism, but in the face of uh, Tarantino, who is all definitely the 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 other part of of this uh, postmodernism. But and it, uh, my personal opinion about uh, Tarantino is that it's quite noisy cinema. So you get everything and you get nothing. So you don't. You don't really. It is, it's good cinema. I'm, I'm agreeing that you are going to to the cinema just to relax, and that that's the thing that gives you that. But the uh, the other level of postmodernism for me is the last film that I was watch, uh, watched is Drive My Car. You've got couple of different perspectives of the character. You've got so mixed plots between each other that when you're trying to understand the main one, you understand, first of all, you understand that from the first like typical perspective. But then that the thing that postmodern is trying to say us that nothing is simple, but still it's confusion, but it shows us not in a simple way, uh, in a simple way, sorry. Not simple stuff in a simple way. And that is considering the culture that is selling now worldwide, the um, Japan culture, Japan cinema. Would you like to, to add? No, uh, Maybe someone disagrees. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to uh, disagree. <laughs> Uh, talking about Tarantino's films just because I'm a fan, so uh, maybe it's not uh, so objective uh, to uh, tell something against your words, uh, words uh, just because uh, I'm in love with these films and it makes me uh, emotionally uh, in another mood, so uh, all, I, all I can see is like... Um, in, uh, I see everything and uh, I mark it like it's correctly and perfectly for me, you know? So that's why uh, I just uh, thought to myself that maybe I shouldn't. Uh, you're right, he's a great cinematographer, he's a great writer, but his cinema for me is a noise and sometimes noise is a little bit too much. That's just my, you know, view. I'm, I'm watching all his films. I really admire the way he works and admire the idea that he's trying to, you know, sell to the um, cinema history. Because that's true that th exactly Tarantino was the, the man, the director who started postmodernism. But as all other um, cultural ways, it starts to to change, and I guess that they think one time will just people will you know as with the um, uh, superhero movies, one one day it will end, hopefully, <laughs> but still, it's just too much. Um, I, I don't know if we uh, we are just a bit out of this. S subject, <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> but uh, um, but I believe uh, uh, that w when you started to talk about the um, um, mm, the cultural mobility of um, some uh, different than Western uh, uh, cultural traditions, like. Uh, uh, Japan or other, m let's say, minor um, cultures, minor uh, uh, in relation to Western uh, American, Ameri American, European um, uh, cultural mo uh, patterns. But um, you, you, you uh, slightly forgot uh, about the system of distribution of the movies. So it, it's not like that that uh, you have a beautiful cinema and you somehow naively believe that f just for the beauty of this cinema or the, the importance of this culture, it will be distributed uh, all over the world. It's not like that. This is a paradox about which we were talking just before this lecture, that 
It's a strange moment. This war is a strange moment, but it gives Ukrainian culture a huge visibility. So you can take it or you, 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 you can lose it. I mean, because normally, well, even with Polish culture, with Belgian culture, I mean, who cares actually about, you know, who, who cares about Macedonia? No, nobody. I mean, who learns Macedonian language or, I, I don't know, any other Serbian language? I mean, in, in the global context, you will be always one of many, one of million of the others. So, to, to um, this visibility, paradoxical visibility, uh, it's also beneficiary, but I was trying to say that not at every price, as you say, because sometimes the hyper visibility can dehumanize you, I mean, can impose on you, you uh, and other countries that are in state of the war, the role of a victim. I don't know that being always a victim, no, but is always a, ben a benefit, I mean, it's always beneficiary. I believe that my fr Ukrainian friends, the theater directors, they are saying, I'm fed up with this kind of represent, re representation of my country as a victim. I, I, I don't want to be seen as a, always as a victim or play a role of a, I don't know, um, uh, wartime mi migrant. Is, is that... Yeah, do you, are you tired? I mean, do you face the same feeling sometimes that, you know... Uh uh, right, uh, talking, uh, talking about all this context, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I hope I can uh, say not only, like, you know, uh, as for me, but as uh, for many Ukrainians, I guess, uh, a lot of people would say that uh, just simply fact uh, that it uh, all happened and caused is uh, very very bad, like in generally. Uh, so um, being a victim uh, uh, in um, in this course uh, is uh, like uh, that fact that uh, everyone would like to uh, you know like. Uh, not to see in their life. I mean, um, for, for now, uh, topic uh, is uh, like uh, not only <clears throat> talking about status of victim or how does people feel um, in all these occasions, uh, but uh, uh, also about uh, the fact that they would be uh, grateful if uh, it all uh, could disappear because of uh, um, the level of pain, for, for example, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, this fact. Uh, but um, uh, if uh, uh, to say like uh, you know what is uh, uh, what is like uh, to um, fill that role to be in a role of a victim um, well uh, in general uh, for uh, one person uh, psychologically it's very hard uh, I mean, uh, at the same time, all the time being uh, in the same uh, status, in the same mood, uh, in the same situation, uh, it causes an anxiety. Uh, it uh, causes uh, a lot of, um, you know, like uh, you're wearing a bag for a very long period of time. Uh, too heavy on your shoulders, uh, too heavy in your body. Uh, there is a lot of um, trash inside just because it doesn't stop. Uh, and people are uh, believing in something, and that fact that uh, uh, everybody is doing something, uh, but uh, even if uh, we are talking about that everybody is doing something and this something is really huge, um, it feels like it's not enough. Uh, it doesn't stop. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we all uh, believe in trust uh, that uh, we are so close, so, cl so close uh, for that moment to not become a victim and no more time. Uh, but um, 
an other status, you know, that helps us uh, to feel relief uh, because, uh, you know, like, uh, you wake up and um, from the very beginning of the day, uh, the first thoughts uh, that appear in your mind, they, like, uh, uh, can, um, can build whole your day because of, uh, because of thoughts combined in that way. And after that, during this day, uh, you continue to uh, think about uh, those uh, general uh, first three, five thoughts, you know. It works this way. Uh, you, like, can program yourself. And every Ukrainian is waking up, and, of course, uh, the first thing uh, that uh, every Ukrainian is thinking about is war is, is hilarious, you know. So... I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there was an an answer, but uh, you know, just opinion that I wanted to share. Yeah, it's something that you uh, raised up that it is really hard to communicate this feeling. Mm -hmm. Yesterday there was a, a, a talk uh, uh, organized by Rosa Sarkisian, um, a Ukrainian director, who who raise this topic, how to speak about war. Because, um, uh, well, Western culture uh, uh, has no living examples of this kind because they have only, let's say, a repertory of performances about the war you know, the popular culture, the cinematographic culture, these are the patterns of how to speak about the probably past wars. Mm -hmm. And this is an ongoing war, and actually it is a problem how to communicate, to be heard, what kind of cultural scenarios can we call for uh, make people understand how we feel. I mean, we, I have nothing to say about, I'm in a comfortable position here in Krakow that n n nothing threatens m my life. But I, 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 I see people that on the daily bas basis, as you said, are mm -hmm. facing the war. H how can then be, be, they be hurt? How can they communicate this feeling? I read sometimes uh, on Facebook, obviously, what Natalia Vorosbyt mm -hmm. is writing, mm -hmm. and she's uh, really ironic about the, uh, ironic and at the same time tragic, mm -hmm. tragical about uh, you know her living in Kiev now because he says, okay, one day I'm going to uh, to to the shop to IKEA, or I don't know where, to buy a lamp. And she says, look, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to use this lamp this winter because there will be no electricity probably. But at the moment I thought that there will be no electricity, I immediately bought another lamp. So she went out from the shop with two lamps. Yeah. And, and she said, I've just uh, had a message from my uh, husband that new bombs uh, were um, uh, well, dropped on Kiev, mm -hmm. but uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm going out with, from the shop with two lamps. Mm -hmm. And she said, my friend at the beginning of the year bought a completely new apartment in Kiev with all her savings, and she doesn't regret. So it's like, a, you know, build up a narration that counters, counteract, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, this being of, uh, of, you know, a typical scenario of being a victim. Yeah. And I, I, I think this is really productive, I mean, yeah. Sure. It's really cool to talk about this since, um, uh, from different positions and uh, different uh, types of view, po points of view, um, just because um, 
you can uh, see it from another side and add something more, uh, add something new, and you can describe it in a different way. Mm, and uh, to me, uh, it is a way how uh, new suggestions uh, can appear. Uh, just uh, new combinations, you know, uh, while talking about something with different people. So uh, it feels uh, like it works this way. And thank you for this information because, uh, you know, in that moment you were talking about that it inspired me. And I thought uh, about um, uh, this way of uh, uh, counter uh, re reacting, yeah? Con con counteracting. Uh, that's uh, that's really cool, and um, um, I'd like to see how people use it uh, more uh, more often. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I don't know, we have out of time probably. We are out of time. Never. Never. <laughs> We're never out of time. <laughs> thank you. Inside, uh, but I would like to thank you for the discussion and present intervention. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Thank you for the discussion. Uh, uh, I didn't interrupt. Uh, I have many questions in uh, this topic. Uh, and I think this topic is something uh, what uh, we want to uh, be back, develop uh, in uh, all season about that hybrid uh, languages, about uh, uh, mix of uh, realities, mix of languages, uh, about uh, performing, uh, and you used beautiful term, I don't know how it uh, is in English, rozszczelnianie uh, polskiego języka. Yeah, because as I uh, now, for a long time, collaborating with <laughs> artists, uh, musicians, pr producers from Ukraine, Belarus, from, uh, like, let's say, our region, uh, <clears throat> I know that uh, it's not that uh, that's, it's just simple Eastern-Western rela relation, what's happening here. It's uh, like a mix uh, of... Uh, more regional, provincial, more uh, like a small centers, local centers, which are uh, like uh, uh, points uh, to uh, uh, connect people, to to uh, to compress some ideas, activities, and uh, uh, I remember Eva, our uh, conversation about. Uh, uh, like a number of theaters in Kharkov, uh, in yeah. Kiev, which is uh, much more bigger than, uh, for example, in Krakow and in uh, Warsaw. And uh, we're a small state uh, between big imperial <laughs> influences for hundreds uh, or thousand, oh, thousand years. Uh, our history is uh, shorter Polish than Ukrainian, the written one. And uh, also I think we can uh, play with some partition and influences, I think, uh, what means uh, Krakow and uh, that's relation between medieval Kiev, between uh, Moravia uh, state and that's, uh, that's uh, Guagolica, the alphabet before Cyrilica was uh, <laughs> probably the first uh, use uh, in our region and in this what uh, at the beginning Krakow was in this wooden small town village or how to call it and still I think uh, this is small town and uh, uh, that's uh, last year change the social landscape so much uh, and open us uh, not only uh, to uh, Ukrainian, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I think that you guys uh, shows us al also like a other, uh, um, other uh, 
I want to say in a technician way, like other elements of this uh, complicated setup or something like that, that there are Belarusian, that your relation are so very strange, that uh, the Belarusian language, which is uh, like a newborn, uh, no, no, re, re, reanimate uh, in this name. The reanimation, I think, is the very important term that we start to use uh, also about uh, animation, about this uh, virtual uh, activities, and also is going from the medicine and uh, from uh, working with trauma, working with uh, this uh, victim uh, position and uh, uh, being stuck in this. Uh, and. Uh, Thank you. That's uh, maybe it was too long, uh, but uh, it's even it's just the beginning of uh, the process and the investigation. Thank you we for want the to feedback. Continue. Yeah. Thanks. Some music from Noir uh, from the first uh, Ephir. Oh, term Ephir we use, uh, which is uh, yeah uh, in in each language. Uh, who are talking here, the Ephir is a kind of, is a state of uh, like uh, mind and body and uh, Ephirization is something what we are in, <laughs> like uh, being uh, in the same time with uh, different spaces, times, conditions and uh, searching for uh, links uh, and uh, learning from this because it's like a multidimensional space uh, which is so so inspiring uh, for like a daily spending time in the studio so thanks that uh, you are here that we have you here and uh, yeah see you later i hope Get this thing off the ground. 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 Get this thing off the ground.
Rzucamy pytanko w przestrzeń i różne wirtualne przestrzenie i różne komunikatory i kontakty ludzko-maszynowe i pytamy, gdzie jest Carbon, gdzie jest Aleksandra Halepa, czekając na Aleksandrę, która miała przyjechać do nas. Może coś się stało, nie wiemy, będziemy się zaraz dowiadywać i w oczekiwaniu mała podróż wstecz do jednego z pierwszych efirów przepraszam, drugiego sezonu i rozmowa moja, Roma. Ja jestem Ram Dziadkiewicz and uh, there is a conversation uh, with uh, Aleksandra Halepa uh, from Carbon Community, Carbon Residency, curator and uh, manager of the um, community of media, artists, media freaks, uh, based uh, originally in uh, Kiev, uh, but uh, now dispersed uh, around the Europe and uh, <laughs> yeah, we are waiting uh, for you. Hello everybody, Ukraine TV is back and uh, my name is Roman Dziadkiewicz and uh, here is also Aleksandra, Aleksandra Kalepa. Kalepa. Yeah, we are, this is our second interview and uh, we met and our second meeting, yeah. let's say like that. Yes. And uh, there will be something more. Let's uh, start to talk about future, please. Okay. So we will uh, develop our collaboration into the residency. So first we showed a uh, um, series of uh, works and also um, um, performance uh, during our first meeting. It was uh, during Krakow um, uh, Art Week. And right now <coughs> we are developing an uh, artistic residency in uh, probably in um, October or uh, beginning of November. Uh, uh, we have an idea to combine uh, um, a Ukrainian and uh, Polish artists, uh, digital artists, uh, uh, during uh, 10 up to um, 14 uh, days. Uh, they will uh, make some uh, projects together and uh, then we will show them uh, in a um, like festival mood. Uh, yes, they're uh, joint projects uh, and uh, it will be also about the topic how the three, uh, um, three times like future, past and uh, the present can combine into one moment. So this is the essence of our idea. Yeah, and this is our daily life in Ukraine TV and this studio also. And uh, Alexandra represents Carbon Media Lab, Carbon Community. Uh, what's happened with you guys? Uh, like uh, now uh, you are uh, in the move uh, from France to Kiev right now. Yeah. You are going there and... Uh, yeah, yeah, so right now, uh, uh, basically, uh, our community is based in Kyiv. Uh, we have a um, uh, laboratory and also we have a space in uh, Kyiv, in uh, Padil. Uh, uh, basically, we are, our um, essence and our um, strategy and our mission is to um, um, uh, to make uh, digital art inside of the post-industrial spaces and uh, um, how we can uh, revitalize this post-industrial uh, spaces and fulfill it uh, uh, with uh, digital art. So this is our idea and uh, our community is uh, about uh, 500 artists but basically 30 of them are really like um, 
active uh, uh, in our community so we are making uh, different projects festivals laboratories uh, exhibitions uh, lectures and all all uh, around digital art and all around artistic practices and how to combine them with uh, uh, experimental music and performative art so this is also our uh, like three dimensions is uh, the digital uh, digital art is our main dimension and uh, two more is like um, experimental music and also um, um, performance uh, and we are also um, gathered uh, about uh, live uh, live making uh, shows uh, audiovisual performances and uh, perf performances physical we are trying to make everything live as you were talking about uh, your daily activity in May or beginning of June, uh, of course the war was the most important oh. context uh, and uh, uh, the situation that many of artists take part uh, in uh, defense activities yeah. and uh, they are in army, they are in uh, IT army. Yeah. Um, how it looks now? And uh, uh, so basically, the from needs are maybe different yeah. or something changed and uh, so. Uh, Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, mm, with this can, um, like war um, state, we uh, transformed, uh, transformed our activity uh, into more like um, investigation and also a questioning. And we launched a project called When War Will End. So actually this project is uh, like a manifesto, so we will make art and uh, uh, make uh, create uh, art until war will end so it's ongoing project and we are sharing all the activities and everyone could participate in it and even uh, uh, spectaculars and visitors could also change something so uh, this is like something like a performance like it is and it's happening live so basically first when war came uh, we uh, started to um, collect uh, some uh, money for our artists because uh, some of them are, are right now in an uh, army so we tried to um, defend them, uh, them like in the way of collecting for their um, equipment and right now um, <coughs> we uh, made it and uh, more uh, focused on our artistic activities and uh, at first it was like a collecting of artistic wor works, it uh, was um, all about the topic uh, when war will end and all about the video art. Then we uh, made a showcases uh, in uh, Krakow, in um, France and in uh, Berlin. And right now uh, we are trying to to find the essence and topics uh, about what we will work in the in other mode it will be like a residency mode and uh, the first residency it will be with you uh, in Krakow uh, and then it, it will be with all our partners that we are connected during this time thanks we are in uh let's say middle of uh, August, uh, probably we'll show this uh, conversation at the beginning of September, but still uh, we are in process of uh, preparation of this uh, first residency and uh, collecting uh, artist topics uh, and combining that uh, um, elements of this multi-dimensional and also inter interdisciplinary uh, combination and uh, experimentation our studio is ex exactly for this kind of uh, um, research uh, and uh, activities uh, and uh, hope uh, it will be also like a one step more and uh, part of a uh, long-term uh, collaboration because what as you start to talk about war and at the beginning was talking also about this post-industrial uh, context of your uh, activity I start to think also about post-war 
uh, context and period and maybe some fantasies about this I would like to ask you about uh, what you imagine your activity in that uh, yeah. period so basically uh, with the, within this project when we, where we end we are asking uh, uh, artists uh, uh, what um, actually what were the reasons of war what actually bring this war to us? This is like a question about past. And uh, what we are uh, having right now, what experience we are having right now and the personal experience, it's a, it's a question about now. And uh, what will happen next after war? And what will happen with Ukraine after war? So it's uh, our third uh, question. And basically, uh, it's uh, three questions of this project. And artists are f really free to discuss and to uh, search uh, the answers for these questions. OK, so we are waiting also for that answers and also of course for the end of the war and uh, yeah. Slava to Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah glory to, to Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, we also maybe uh, answer on these questions during our residency. We will ask, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, you everyone. <laughs> Greetings to Alexandra, wherever you are, wherever you are, uh, Call us, uh, come to our event, uh, <laughs> to our hybrid place, uh, even uh, physically or maybe uh, in a virtual way. Uh, we will searching for you, but waiting uh, for next uh, parts of our program. Uh, also some music from archive uh, of Ukraina TV. Space Kate. And first our jingle for a uh, second uh, mm, season. <coughs> Hooks to space gate from past, from present, and from future. Hope we will see each other soon. Hello, hello.
пожелаю. Ну, ты да. Как у меня дела? Хорошо пожелаешь. А я плохо. Слушай, сколько мы не виделись? 15 лет. Ты такая умная, мудрая. Ты у нас на курсе. Умнее всех была. Слушай, откуда ты взялся? Я? В командировке. Вспомнил, что ты в этом городе обретаешься. Обретаюсь. Ну, садись. Чай, кофе, раздевайся. Капучи. Я буду ходить. Я люблю свою жену, понимаешь? Ты понимаешь? Ты слышишь? Мы прожили 10 лет. Ну, я сяду. А ты, собственно, кто? Олег или Юра, у тебя же был брат на параллельном курсе. Да. Садись, ради бога. Брат у меня был, я встретил девушку, женщину. Я влюбился, я люблю ее. Это ты про прошлое, про жену? Три месяца назад я встретил... Другую женщину. Я не знаю, что мне делать, как жить. Я жду от тебя совета. Ты, ты всегда все знаешь, все понимаешь. Совета? Мы не виделись 20 лет. Ну, ну как, ну... Я люблю свою жену. Я люблю Люду. Ну, как ты доехал? Поездом, самолетом? Ну, люби их обеих, раз ты так чувствуешь. Что? Это ты мне советуешь? Заедать век двум женщинам? Делать их несчастными, ну, ну, ну это безнравственно, ну не ожидала от тебя. Ну разведись тогда, женись на люди. Я сказал же, я люблю свою жену. Мы прожили 10 лет. Не ожидал такого совета. Может, мне уйти? Давай выпьем чаю или кофе. Да мне не до чая, не до кофе. Мне плохо. Ну, я думаю, Люда, это увлечение. Это пройдет. Ты оставайся с женой. А Люда, это пройдет. Я люблю ее. Больше всего на свете. Я Людочку люблю. Больше жизни. Больше жены? Ну, тогда же ясно, развод. Не ожидал от тебя такого. Неужели ты не понимаешь, как все это сложно? Две прекрасные женщины, и я их мучаю. Мне кажется, тебе нравится мучить двух прекрасных женщин. И меня тоже. Что? Мучаешь. Ну что ж, раз я в тягость, какая ты черствая, я думал, ты другая. Я не знаю, что мне делать, как жить. Ну ты остановись и живи, как живешь. Оно само с собой как-нибудь как образуется. Можно поехать куда-нибудь, отвлечься. Да, вот я и поехал в командировку. Я не знаю, что сказать. Я не советчица. Слушай, нравится тебе эта картина? 
Я ее только что в подарок получила. Mm -hmm. Представляешь? Я называю ее привидение в кресле. Нравится тебе? Да, нравится. Очень нам нравится. Только я не знаю, куда ее повесить. Наверное, придется что-то снять. Да. Я думал, как она скажет, так и сделаю. Ну, как ты скажешь, так и сделаю. И будь что будет, а ты. Ну, знаешь, какие у тебя варианты? Только три варианта. Или одна, или другая. Или обе вместе. Или бросить обеих и скрыться. Нет, я не хочу ее здесь да. вешать. Она может на голову упасть. Может быть. Вот какая ты бездушная оказалась. Считай, что мы с тобой поссорились. Студенточка, вечерняя заря, Под липою я целовал тебя. Или обнимал, не помню. Счастливы будем мы, наслаждаясь голубым Днепром И вдыхая аромат ночной, любовался я тобой. Не помнишь ты, но помню я. С тревогою. Я ожидал тебя на берегу пруда, любовался я тобою, и пленился я навек тобой под серебристою луной. Соседка! Тут пришли мужчина. Запускайте. По реке грим кладет мазками резкими. Рыдается тоске. Нет, ее я другим ласкается. Понимаешь, Нет, не ее знаю, ее как начать. Ну сними шляпу, прости, как я поживаю. Как у меня дела? Ты-то хорошо поживаешь. Я плохо. А я специалист службы защиты информации при Министерстве обороны. Сколько мы не виделись? Семь лет. Мы не видели шесть Семь лет. Ты такая умная, мудрая. Ты у нас на курсе умнее всех была. Я да, я да. А ты, собственно, кто? Олег или Юра? У тебя же был брат на параллельном курсе. Да, близнецы мы. Да, брат у меня был. Я встретил девушку, женщину, я влюбился. Это ты сейчас про прошлое, про жену? Э, три месяца назад я полюбил другую женщину. Я не знаю, что мне делать. Я жду от тебя совета. Ты всегда все совета? знаешь и все понимаешь. Да мы не видели шесть лет. Семь. Я люблю свою жену и люблю Люду. Мама мыла Раму, Рама мыла Кришну. Ну ты когда ехал? Ты поездом или самолетом? На О, какой взгляд. Ну, люби их обеих, раз ты так чувствуешь. Не ожидал от тебя. Ну, разведись тогда, женись на люди своей. 
Я же сказал, я люблю свою жену. Мы прожили семь лет. Не ожидал от тебя такого совета. Может быть, мне уйти? Ну, давай выпьем чаю или кофе. Ну, мне не до чая и не до кофе. Мне плохо. Ну, я думаю, что Люда, Люда это увлечение, которое пройдет. А ты оставайся женой. А Люда, Люда это пройдет. Не трогай меня своими руками, своими пальцами. Baby. Я люблю ее больше всего на свете. Я Людочку люблю больше жизни. И больше жены. Тут же все ясно. Развод. Ну что ж, ну что ж. Я не ожидал от тебя таких слов. Неужели ты не понимаешь, как все это сложно? Две прекрасные женщины, и я их мучаю. По-моему, тебе это нравится. Мучить двух прекрасных женщин и меня тоже. Что? Мучаешь. Раз я в тягость, какая ты черствая. Я думал, ты другая. Я не знаю, что мне делать. Как жить? А ты остановись. И живи, как живешь. А оно само как-нибудь, как-нибудь образуется. Тебе нужно куда-то поехать. Отключиться. Ну вот я и поехал в командировку. Я не знаю, что сказать. Я уж не советчица. Кстати, нравится тебе эта картина? Она ровно висит. Я только что ее получила в подарок. Представляешь? Я называю ее привидение в кресле. Тебе нравится? Да, нравится. Очень нравится. Я думал, вот как она скажет, как ты скажешь, так и сделаю. И будь что будет. А ты его. Вот... Ну, какой же у тебя выход или выбор? У тебя только три варианта. Или одна, или другая, или обе вместе. А лучше брось их обеих и скройся. Да, может быть. Вот ты какая бездушная оказалась. Моя девочка с плейером. Считай, что мы с тобой поссорились. Да ты не такой, как все, и не любишь дискотеки, я не буду тебя Эту спасать. Эту песню пела одна Обнимать, наша с тобой сокурсница. Меньше всего нужны мне твои камбэки. Вряд ли пела наша с тобой сокурсница. И, и, и а, очень новая, пошлая, новая дурацкая и вульгарная. И Я пришел, может. Прости меня. Прости, извини меня. Я был грубым. Ну, то есть я вел себя грубо. Почему ты молчишь? Когда ты уезжаешь? Ну, когда я уезжаю. У меня здесь большая работа. Знаешь, вообще-то я занята. Можешь посмотреть журналы, книги. Телевизор мне будет мешать. Там на кухне есть чай, кофе, еда какая-то. Не стесняйся. Говорить на эту твою больную тему я больше не могу. Но я не могу ни о чем другом говорить. Понимаешь, думать, прости меня. Тогда сиди молча или уходи. Не прогоняй меня. Занято. Я все ясно сказала. Ты замужем? Сейчас нет. Разведена? Вообще-то я очень скрытный человек. Это во-первых. Во-вторых, я очень занята. В-третьих, ты меня пугаешь. Ты похож на сумасшедшего. Ты можешь молчать. 
Нет, наверное. Что мне делать? Позвони в милицию. М -м, дозвонилась. Привет. Ты мне обещала рецепт джема. Да, я пишу. Вообще-то я тоже скрытный. Да уж не без того. Э, я не тебе. Да, пишу. Сочные плоды. Мне плохо. Удалить пушок. Тебя любят, обожают две женщины. Ну перестань издеваться, ну перестань издеваться, ну перестань издеваться. Пожалуйста, уйди, приходи в другом настроении. У меня не может быть другого настроения, я могу быть без Людочки. Будь с Людочкой. А жена? Кстати, как зовут твою жену? Это не важно, ну зачем ты спрашиваешь? Она замечательный человек, извини. Ее зовут Люся. Советую попытаться тебе ее возненавидеть. Ой, скорее я тебя возненавижу. Это что, обе Людмилы получается? Я скорее тебя возненавижу. Если это облегчит твое состояние. Я могу написать твоей жене на нимку. Люси могу написать о твоих похождениях, о твоих страданиях. Да она знает, послушай. Ну все все знают. Послушай, ты меня доведешь до самоубийства. Самоубийство командировочного. Уходи немедленно. Уходи в свою гостиницу. Хочешь самоубиваться? Самоубивайся. Оставь записку. Обвини меня в черствости. Вот реальный выход. Оставь меня в покое. Я больше не приду. Ты очень плохой человек. У меня в этом городе больше никого знакомого нет. И столько в тебе душевных переливов, и столько аналитических мыслей, сентенций, и столько страданий невыносимых. Как всего этого избежать? Да все дико просто. Напиться и лечь спать. А если не поможет, еще раз напиться и лечь спать. Прощаю. Я тебя ненавижу.
Слушай. Слушай. Куда?
То есть нет, я запуталась. Если бы не ты умер, а Люда и Люси умерли. Ну все живы, слава богу. Это пошло. А сейчас еще пошли будет. Я хочу тебя развеселить. Анекдот, знаешь, вы свою жену любите? Люблю. Почему вы ей изменяете? Хочется. Студенточка Заря Восточная. Под липами я целовал тебя. И раздевал тебя. Целовал. Раздевал тебя. Целовал. Раздевал. Счастливы были мы, наслаждаясь голубым Днепром. И вдыхая аромат ночной, любовался тобой. Эту песню всегда пел наш с тобой однокурсник. Но ты песню не мог петь наш с тобой однокурсник. Это очень старинная песня. И очень пошлая, вульгарная и дурацкая. Сердце красавиц склонно к измене и к перемене, как ветер. Нежной улыбкой страсти клянутся, плачут, смеются, нам изменяют, вечно смеются. Постояльцами вновь открывшейся гостиницы «Звездочка» обнаружен труп повешенного мужчины. Найденная рядом записка свидетельствует о самоубийстве командировочного. Это не я. Один на нашем, кстати, этаже повесился. Я еще жив. Я, собственно, и не стал бы вешаться. Я бы как-нибудь иначе. Я поняла. Что? Все, что ты сказал, я поняла. Я услышала и поняла. Это не я, нет. Ты жив, слава богу. Нет. Слушай, а ты меня уже на работе достал. От тебя не спрячешься. Как тебе это удалось? Ну, ты же сама сказала, домой больше не приходить. Ну, Но... не будем уточнять, домой ли, вообще ли. Слушай, а ты кого-нибудь из наших видишь? Встречаешься? Я захожу, представь, в купе поезда как-то в Москве, а? а там Зиночка и Ковенко, только расколстевшая. Представляешь, так забавно было, вместе ехали. А тебе твои сокурсники не интересны? А, да. Что да? Ну, не знаю, не думал об этом. Наверное, не о чем говорить. Принужденность какая-то. Прошлое прошло. Ну, раз прошлое прошло, то и очнись. Нас так много вокруг. Сегодня, сейчас. Нас, я имею в виду людей. А? Толпы людей, как толпы звезд. А Людмил сколько представляешь? Всякие Люсечки, Милочки. Людочки, Людмилочки. Разные, разные, разные. Это пошло. Да, это пошло. А сейчас еще пошлее будет. Помнишь анекдот? Вы любите свою жену? Люблю. А почему вы ей изменяете? Хочется. Апофеоз эгоизма. Держи, держи, держи! О, как, как, 
Так, я хочу получить я эту роль, так это что надо? Без договора. А между тем, Возьмите я предупреждала, что у меня в жизни была точно даже, такая же ситуация. Не разрешу даже тон положить себе на лицо без заключения отдельного договора на кинопроб. И я пробовалась без договора по просьбе режиссера. Послушай, ты не можешь разузнать, что это из системы начать Да подожди, я не вам. Есть у меня шанс. И вам должно быть стыдно. Бомба, конечно, бомба. Конечно, бомба. Это полная бомба. А ты тоже хороша. Не подала мне реплику. Я хожу там как дур... Бесстыжий. Бесстыжим, да. это она меня по телефону называет. Это что? Почему она после конца кинопроб говорит, что пробовалась без договора? Это зачем? Это что, прием такой? И все заходят, суета какая-то, а камера не выключается после стопа. Ой, ну да, вероятно, такой прием. Ты так меня спрашиваешь, как будто я это он. Он же умер, погиб. Откуда я знаю, что именно он имел в виду? Это же все эскизы, пробы. Да. Ну как руины, обгорелые части писем. Но... Да. Он вообще часто говорил, что некоторые сцены кинопроб войдут в окончательный монтаж фильма. Mm -hmm. Он вообще говорил, что съемка кино – это мистический процесс. Ну, такие у него были мозговые завихрения. Но это все к делу не относится. Есть еще материал. Кинопробы других актеров. Да. Мы будем их смотреть? Так, так. Ну, я говорю это к тому, что если мы будем пытаться продолжить и закончить его фильм, его работу, нам же нужно их посмотреть, так? Конечно. Конечно, мы будем смотреть кинопробы. Я вижу, он все смонтировал. Да. Значит, это у него такой прием. Кино и жизнь. Это не ново. Но в этом есть своя милота. Сердце Обнаружен труп повешенного мужчины. Найденная рядом записка свидетельствует о самоубийстве командировочного. Это все новости на этот час. У тебя, как всегда, доброго. входная дверь на распашку я захлопнул. А это не я, это, кстати, один на нашем этаже взял и повесился. А я вот живой. Да, собственно, я не стал бы вешаться, я бы как-то иначе. Я поняла. Хм? Что? Все, что я услышала, я... Поняла. Слава Богу, ты живой. Mm -hmm. Это не я. Это один на нашем этаже. Взял и повесился. А я вот он. Студенточка. Заря восточная. Хм, опять запела. Ну, опять она поет. Я раздевал Пи тебя. Не умеет же пить и поет. Вообще ни голоса, ни слуха. И опять запела. Хотя я не могу понять, как это. Зачем пить, если человек не умеет петь? Вот как человек может петь, если он не умеет петь? 
не про... Во-первых, не раздевал тебя, а целовал тебя, между прочим. И вдыхая аромат Эту ночной. песню всегда пел наш с тобой сокурсник. Я вынуждена тебе повторить, что это старинная песня, ретро. Угу. В таком случае я вынужден тебе повторить, что это очень пошлая, вульгарная и дурацкая песня. Это очень пошлая, вульгарная и дурацкая песня. Я, понимаешь, не знаю, как начать. Ну, сними шляпу, ну, спроси меня, как я поживаю, как мои дела. Ну, ты ты хорошо поживаешь, а я плохо. Слушай, сколько мы не видели? Десять лет. Ты такая умная, мудрая. Ты у нас на курсе умнее всех была. Слушай, откуда ты взялся? Я? Угу. А я в командировке. Я вспомнил, что ты здесь, в этом городе, обретаешься. Обретаюсь. Ну, садись. Чай, кофе. Не-не, капучино. Я буду ходить. Я... Я люблю свою жену, понимаешь? Ты... Понимаешь? Я... Ты слышишь, мы прожили 10 лет. Я сяду. А ты, собственно, кто? Олег или Юра? У тебя же был брат на параллельном курсе. Да, ради бога, ты садись, я буду ходить. Да, брат у меня был. Я встретил девушку, я влюбился, я люблю ее. Это ты про прошлое, про жену? Я три месяца тому назад я полюбил другую женщину. Я жду от тебя ответа. Ответа я не знаю, что мне делать. Я, я жду твоего совета. Совета? Мы же не виделись 10 лет. Я люблю свою жену, и я люблю Люду. Ну, как ты доехал? Ты поездом... Самолетом. Ну, люби обеих. Раз ты так чувствуешь, ну, люби обеих. Что? То есть ты это мне советуешь? Заедать век двум женщинам, двум делать, женщинам их делать их несчастными? Я не ожидала от тебя. Ну, тогда разведись и женись на люди, на люди. Да я же сказал, что я люблю свою жену. Мы прожили 10 лет. Я не ожидала тебя таких слов. Слушай, мне может уйти. Давай выпьем. Или кофе. Мне не до чая, не до кофе, мне плохо.
Kurwa, co to jest? Nie wiem. Kurwa, kamerą, nie? I potem mnie tam przesuń, nie? Powiększ tak, żebym był obok herta. Na pierwszej dwadzie. And... Uh, yeah, I need bite. Oh, it's good. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, uh, we need to be on time. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. I'm here. Musisz mnie powiększyć, nie? Musimy yeah. wyczyścić, jakby zrób taki plan. Nie? Wszystkie ustawienia. Ale pojedynczego, co? Hmm? I dawaj mnie tylko ja, bez żadnego tła. Właśnie Hert ma zielone tło. No to jest coś tam. Halo, halo, Amsterdam. Możemy obrócić tam, no? Co? Mhm. A. A. The delay is phenomenal. Uh, how many seconds? <laughs> Too many. Halo, 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 halo.
Yes. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. Jakbyś miał chwilę, żeby się pobawić trochę kolorem, nie? Mnie tam doprowadzić do wyglądu. A dajcie nam e, Sound of Heart. Hello Amsterdam. I hope you hear me. I yes. hope uh, we will yes. hear you. Also. Yes, the sound of Amsterdam. Yeah. Glad did it finally. And uh, Julia, I. I was sleeping for the last uh, like half one and half hour because I think that's a, oh I'm better and better uh, my vision my view and uh, yeah we are in humans a, like to sleep a fearization state which is something extremely strange I mix of pixels a mix of uh, but a mix of uh, i don't know, electronic, uh, uh, electric uh, 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 confusions in uh, myself and around. Uh, but uh, it works everything, uh, we're still here. It was uh, one explosion of the computer, the main station, and hope, hope you are fine in Amsterdam. Heart Loving is here. Roman Dziadkiewicz is here and let's count delay. Yes, hello. Uh, Rom, I have my first question to you. Yeah? Okay, can you take us back to the first broadcast of Ukraina TV because we're very curious the first how did it all start we already start meetings like brainstorming uh, like few days uh, before uh, the war the escalation of the war starts uh, because from our point of view from Krakow, it was uh, not only the story of the uh, war, but it was a uh, uh, story of refugees, also a friend of us, a friend of friend who passed Krakow, who, 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 who came to Krakow uh, in those days, uh, in those uh, critical days. Uh, so uh, it was a moment that we start some experimentation with the studio, stream art studio, and there was at the beginning there was the idea to have more like a hybrid production, uh, 3D uh, experimentation with uh, avatars, uh, stuff like that. But in a moment uh, uh, we start to think that, okay, avatars can wait now. We need to meet people, we have tools, this hybrid uh, tools to meet people and at the beginning it was like a, our studio it was like a meeting point uh, as a place to brainstorming, to networking, to also kind of the uh, also short uh, time uh, place for uh, people who I don't know refugees is a good term, but still yes, yes, I think it's, uh, it was a, uh, it was, that was people in need, it was people in need absolutely, uh, people in trauma, people coming to Krakow after uh, spending days and nights in basements, in uh, Kharkov, in Kiev, in uh, other cities, and, uh, and it was like, so we, at the beginning, we wanted just to turn on the cameras and talk about this, about the situation, and to meet people and uh, ask uh, ourselves uh, what to do, how to deal with uh, this completely new situation. Uh, uh, in shock, in shock, I think. And uh, yeah, and it was like a social, political, and also. Um, formal engine to do what we start then and uh, now we are in new place a new studio which is bigger which is more also like open friendly uh, 
as a space as you know and uh, <clears throat> and yeah and now we are like a uh, first time 24 hour it's also like a symbolic format that uh, really TV works like that and we are like, crazy people in the studio spending this 24 hours plays uh, playing with this uh, convention or something like that uh, subversively and uh, yeah and have uh, fun share energy knowledge uh, experimentation spending time uh, together sleeping uh, in the carpet uh, we have a real carpet and now we have also virtual carpet uh, that uh, Julia uh, did for us uh, in VR chat so yeah well, I want to say maybe it's a good moment also to say thank you guys who are here a lot, uh, around uh, and inter introduce uh, Heart Loving uh, Institute of Network Culture and team. Uh, Tommaso is uh, on another side of uh, uh, setup uh, and uh, yeah, and we are really together now here and uh, with you. I'm so exciting and uh, happy to have this continuation and uh, also about future, I hope, uh, with this uh, way between West and East, uh, kind of the transition, new language, uh, new knowledge, uh, new tactics of uh, being together and uh, supporting to each other. Yeah. Thank you, Gert. You are also like a big inspiration for us and also uh, this is a big support. Uh, okay, let's... Uh, Talk about the tactics, tactics. Mm -hmm. Rom? Yeah, about the tactics. Uh, what, um, you what do you have in, in mind? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I think we are like uh, experimentators. <laughs> we connect, I think we connect cables, uh, people, <laughs> signals together. And uh, and this is, I think, this is our tactic because uh, then you are not alone. This is one. You are not. Uh, you are able to uh, to to move also between platforms, also between realities, between present, uh, past, and uh, future, and uh, also. It's like a post-humanistic uh, way, uh, also in a way, because we are connected uh, as a people, we are connected with machines, we are connected with signals, uh, with archives, uh, and it's like a uh, we uh, today few times uh, uh, we used to use this uh, term um, re reanimation like animation, uh, reanimation, going from technology, from uh, uh, forms of uh, working with, with media, and also, of course, from uh, medicine and uh, this reanimation of uh, relations. Uh, I think it's a very important aspect of uh, what we try to do. Uh, Now we are not just uh, providing alternative content. Yeah. Uh, we're not journalists, but uh, we are involved. And uh, what do you see? It's artistic, but it's a bit more than that. Yeah, I think <laughs> this artistic aspect gives us uh, kind of the space, uh, uh, freedom to uh, to do experimentations that uh, works uh, with this reanimation and refreshing of. Uh, Mm, thinking about media, about uh, working together, about this workflow which is uh, uh, 
like more like a collective, collaborative, um, <clears throat> and spending time together uh, in the process of experimentation and uh, searching for some uh, uh, new uh, possibilities, uh, also new forms uh, in uh, between. Uh, um, yeah, that's uh, different aspects because I think the swinging or this moving, uh, like blurring also, uh, that's uh, different uh, um, opportunities or, or, or uh, traditions. So television, performance, uh, uh, like a club, like a place for... Uh, uh, live music, dancing uh, together, and also like a studio that you can talk, you can do experimentation, you can do brain uh, brainstorming, and uh, it's like a yeah. I think uh, it's also something uh, about uh, searching for new form of uh, being uh, visible and new form of uh, uh, exhibition, uh, presentation, uh, distribution of. Uh, uh, art, media art, and uh, production in the field of uh, um, digital culture uh, uh, that uh, is uh, full of opportunities, and I think that uh, there's no limits, no, no limitation. Uh, uh, what is uh, like a state uh, that uh, I'm not so young, uh, and uh, I, but I think I never. I never before felt like uh, like that. Uh, that's uh, uh, yeah. Everything is is in front of us. Uh, it's not that it's done. It's uh, it's like in progress, and uh, we are at the beginning of something. Yeah. People ask us, how do you connect to Ukraine from Krakow? Uh, I I heard about some people that were in uh, the cast uh, coming from Kherson just after the occupation and there's Kiev of course mm -hmm. can you say something a, about people <laughs> yeah, who are there's... involved already now on the Ukrainian side the, um, we're just very curious like, about that uh, yeah like uh, now in the studio, I'm only one Pole. <laughs> so there are like around me three people from Ukraine, one from Italy, one from Belarus, and uh, some other people are around. Uh, Ukrainian dias diaspora in Krakow is quite uh, big and active, uh, and also I think, yes, of course, let's, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is Ksenia. Hi. I was actually laying like right here um, on the floor and was watching your entry and I just want to add because uh, you asked how um, it's connected, right? And when I um, came to Ukraine TV for me, um, it was a it was a, a possibility, a possibility to tell everyone what is going on, and I saw. Since I work here, I saw people who come to us, who came to us, and they were like from Ukraine, and I don't remember actually who it was exactly, like from Harrison. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter because I saw many, many young people who came to us, and they also saw possibility to spread information as more as they could. And I think, and I, I, we did on on the site, we did kind of um, description, so. In our team, we did everyone, uh, you know, said something about Ukraine TV, and that's what I said that I see in Ukraine TV possibility for young Ukrainian artists to show themselves, to tell whole the world, because for them, you know, Krakow, it, it is Europe, right? So they, a lot of people see it as possibility, and it's like amazing because the the. Um, you can easily see it, right? I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but I saw it in people that they wanted to share and to spread it all over. Glad, maybe you want to say something. You was like a, a hero of the first that. part. Uh, 
of the night part, uh, also with your stories, personal stories, and uh, involving also your family and uh, artificial vision, the project of your mom. Let's join us here, yeah. And uh, here is also Anastasia. Yeah, sure. Lab, welcome. <laughs> Hello. Nice to meet you guys uh, in this mixed spaces, times hey. and realities. Um, here with me is Anastasia, uh, with whom we had uh, tarot sands this night. Uh, we were going di deeply uh, to our minds, memories and future through the, um, all the layers of the realities. So, uh, Hello, yeah, we were uh, making some um, predictions. predictions, yeah, and it was uh, really an uh, interesting process because we were like adding some uh, mystic elements and um, we're trying to see uh, what will be the future of this project uh, uh, Ukraina TV and I liked it very much because of atmospheres it is uh, here um, it's uh, a huge pleasure, pleasure for me as an Ukrainian uh, come here to the studio and be able to share my uh, voice share my opinion and position uh, and spread energy with uh, guys over here from a lot of countries. So it was just magnificent. Yeah, uh, I think we are breaking the walls here and we are checking the limits of human bodies, minds, uh, but also limits of uh, electronics because for example we had uh, this night uh, a few a few moments when uh, we were partly blacked out because of the amount of um, uh, electric tension yeah so uh, we're just you know checking and breaking the limits of the of the world of the society of our own minds just to try understand better what is going on in this crazy world and why it's so intense and uh, why it's so difficult to understand and to to be able to also explain to others your views and your sides your decisions so here we created kind of a spaceship which is going through the time and dimensions really fast and really intense mm -hmm. okay and let's uh talk about our plans because uh, because uh, we plan to land one of the Ukraine TV spaceships in Kiev right so uh, yeah 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 um, it's Can you coming. say something about Carbon yes. Group and... Yes, of course. Um, so because this we, is exciting, of course. So, uh, first of all, and uh, the most important, uh, we have people and we have willing of people and need of people to create the next point uh, on this huge and um, unexplored road. So we have our friends and people uh, in all over Ukraine, of Ukraine actually, um, but um, 
if we will stay like uh, in the studio, I think it will be Kiev uh, because it will be the easier, at least for now, <laughs> uh, from some points of view. Uh, so we have um, yes, of a small plan. Also, we are um, making counts of all the needs. But uh, I think uh, the most important uh, is huge value of people thoughts and uh, people ideas fresh and really mind breaking ideas because times where where are we now they are unpredictable but anyway they are so important and unusual and we are just standing um, just before a huge, open, dark, unexplored, but also really interesting space where we would like to just fly. To explore, to explore, you know, the space, and to find something new, some ideas. It feels we like We are that. flying. <laughs> And we will. Okay. Uh, we want to start uh, now the conversation I had uh, earlier on with Svetlana Matvijenko. But before that, we're going to have a DJ set uh, here, live from Amsterdam. That's where I'm waiting. We are waiting for it. Yes, let's start. Okay, great. It was nice to talk with you. In touch.
November 17 for the first time this year. If the snow stays till tomorrow, I thought jogging will be quite an experience. The art of mixed techniques, stepping, jumping, and sliding, while intuitively moving against the flow of blinding headlights. In several hours, my balcony is covered by a thin layer of delicate fresh snow. I open the door and step on it with my feet bare. Stand still for 15 seconds. It's amazing how such extreme cold feels like electric current as it reaches my head crown, running from my bare feet in nanoseconds. And I know, winter is here. All systems in my building are powered by electricity. During the blackouts, I am left without water and heat. My stove is electric, so no cooking either. The internet cuts too, while mobile internet still works for one hour after power outage. Some days, depending on the number of rocket strikes and the overall length of the attack, you may not be able to make a phone call. Thinking proactively in the end of October, I bought a camping gas stove that were all sold out immediately. Now, I went to the market to get proper and retain balloons. When at home, I set one in the stove, but when I turned it on, the gas suddenly spilled out because the balloon was sitting for too long in low temperature. My chemistry lesson lasted for only three seconds, but a most spectacular moment of me standing amid the kitchen with its entire floor on fire was no less educational. Oh, my God.
Svetlana Matvijenko, welcome to Ukraine TV, this time from, from Amsterdam, where we uh, are running the studio of Void, uh, which is part of the Institute of Network Cultures. Um, this is our first participation in the live cast, so it's exciting for us. Um, let me start with the first question at, about your original expertise about cyber warfare, uh, because I n notice that this element is somewhat uh, going in the background. Um, uh, there is the infamous Ukrainian IT army, and we know a very little, little bit about it. We also know that the, the very big, uh, let's say, hacks and cyber conflicts happened, in fact, in 2018. Um, and, um, you know, we don't hear about it so much today. Can you say something about this uh, somewhat uh, underrepresented aspect? Thanks, Geert, for inviting me to speak about this. I'm very glad to share what I know and observed during my year in Ukraine, where I was from the very beginning of the full-scale invasion and even the year preceding it. So there was a lot to observe, watch, and think about. And even when we speak about this war, and I identify this war as cyber war, because in the way how I understand cyber war with my colleague and co-author, Nick Dar Witherford, when we speak about cyber war, we actually mean the intersection of kinetic and digital technologies and cyber. So, and the mixes they form are interesting and different in all wars. Uh, the scale uh, and the intensity of that mix we certainly observe now during the Russia-Ukraine war. So when we think about um, kind of the most typical associations, right, of uh, with cyber, anything cyber warfare, such as hacks, leaks, uh, and so on, so they are certainly happening. And there, were, there are, and there were many of them. From the, like, just around the time of the invasion last year, they were actually happening in huge quantities. And there was an expectation that that war would be one of the kind of mainstreams, uh, you know, to, to unfold. However, uh, if we do not see kind of the cases that we normally associ associate with cyber warfare, it only means that we are looking at the wrong, in the wrong places. This is not so much about hacks. All those things become kind of additional. They only assist um, kind of uh, some major events. And if we really speak about the cyber dimension of this war, we need to think about the role of IT and information-based intelligence in how it's engaged in uh, on the battlefield. Because one of the one of the things that I really uh, find important is that precisely the lack of weapons, like heavy ammunition, right? So tanks. Uh, or um, uh, air defense uh, technology. The lack of all those kind of protective means or the means of uh, restraint for uh, the Russian forces 
created a situation when Ukrainian army really relies on information-based intelligence. And it's happening on the hugest scale. And we have new technologies developed and created and updated for that. And, uh, and uh, they're very, very different. Uh, uh, to interrupt you, the very absurd example is the, is the war in the trenches now, 100 years later, that is done with IT, right? So there exactly. you have this very confusing mix, like we look at, at a retro war more than a century ago, but we have fully realized that this is done with drones, with a lot of intelligence in the background. Exactly. If we, if we take uh, all sort of, you know, sci-fi as a speculative theory, we could see that this sort of war was seen, imagined and visualized kind of, you know, in many ways, right? So whenever we look at some kind of Blade Runner scenes, it's always about a kind of total decay and medieval set where high technology uh, also operates. And so I don't want to kind of simplify and or banalize the current situation, which is, of course, extreme tragedy, uh, <clears throat> sites of genocide and whatnot. But that's what we see. We see precisely World War I acted in there, World War II, and so on. It's war of trenches and artillery. It's war of aircraft, as it was the major thing in, let's say, uh, World War I, and it's cyber war. In cyber war, it's not only because it relies on digital technologies, but precisely because it combines all of them. This is something very important to understand for cyber war. In uh, your Mc McLuhan lecture, uh, during Transmediale in Berlin, which was held inside the Canadian Embassy, uh, you gave an update on uh, nuclear cyber war or nuclear cyber warfare. Is there something like that? Um, um, is that the aspect of uh, threatening with nuclear weapons or attacking nuclear plants? Uh, can you give us a, a summary of what you said the, in Berlin? This is uh, a very important aspect of this war, uh, the nuclear. And that gives the reasons to actually extend the definition of cyber war by including what this nuclear dimension and that's where um, I work with uh, the concept, one concept that helps me to process some most damaging impacts uh, that is happening during this war. The destruction of all sort of very important life relations and energies and substitution of them with new connections, martial connections, right? So military related connections and relations that of course we will stay with us, hopefully not forever, but for a very long time. And when I think about how those connections are being broken, I uh, kind of use this idea, the concept of terror environment. So there is a certain volume to it. So the scope, the territory, the depth, and the scale of uh, kind of those breakages probably could be imagined, shaped, and assessed somehow. So therefore, I feel it's important to think about a kind of like larger <clears throat> spaces where those breakages and ruptures are created. And that's where nuclear comes in, because the nuclear blackmail, right, so helps to shape those terror environments, because terror environments are not only when the subjects of the war are targeted by bombs, it's also when they're targeted by information. 
So that's what for me is very important intersection, right, of um, terror environments. And the nuclear dimension creates a kind of a certain, let's say, expectation, cognitive sphere, the sphere of affect and what not, where certain behaviors could be mobilized or suppressed. And therefore, like with that at place, certain breakages and breakages or certain ruptures or certain targeting is happening. And this is, of course, very important. What's also very important because it's precisely the nuclear dimension helps extending those terror environments far beyond Ukraine, right? So, and that's where we enter in um, kind of different realms. And that's where this affect and fear uh, extends Ukraine. But what's interesting is that in Ukraine, we are not given the place to speak, to negotiate, right? So it's all about erasure and suppression. So the Ukrainian subject is treated as the one that has to be eliminated. But where the nuclear dimension extends beyond Ukraine, that's where it opens the possibility for kind of negotiation under the rules of deterrence, right? Pushing, blackmailing, bullying, threatening everyone around Ukraine to, again, suppress help or, you know, uh, cause certain, again, behaviors, expectations, discourses, and whatnot. So therefore, this war is really nuclear cyber war, right? So because it creates this particular terror environment that Sloterdijk uh, once called atmo-terrorism, and, and even though he spoke about other circumstances, I think it's the most applicable to what is happening now. And of course, of Rio called it the information bomb uh, 25, Absolutely. 30 years ago. And he made that very similar connection between the, the nuclear and the information bomb. Uh, do you think we we should upgrade these theories, let's say, that were maybe you know, formulated in the eighties and nineties? What? How? How do we? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say look back at that period just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, with thirty years later, right? And um, we should uh, theorize the presence. Um, do you also think it's important to make really some new steps there? Uh, some people say, for instance, this war is a proxy war. Do you agree with that? I do think that theory needs updating, but they also um, uh, deserve careful rereading, because I still find a number of kind of theoretical propositions helpful to understand these complexities. These philosophies were uh, targeting certain simple understandings, right? So, mm -hmm. and uh, today uh, we are constantly seduced by certain simple understandings. Well, probably like everywhere, everyone, right? So always. So that's why I think it's important. I use, as Deleuze <laughs> said, I use this concept as tools, right? So I will see where thinking with them takes me. Uh, I'm still very much in the process, right? So it just as far as I could uh, arrive somewhere at this moment. Uh, but it definitely deserves uh, rethinking, uh, doing more work, looking at more particular cases and so on. In terms of proxy war, I do not like and disagree, uh, I do not like this term and disagree with uh, application of this term to the Ukrainian situation because it again simplifies things. Instead of seeing it as a proxy war, I invite 
uh, everyone to think about certain multi-dimensionality of this war and its over-determination. And sometimes you almost need to think topologically in the sense that how certain sides of the event sort of um, disappear from your attention or vision or knowledge or look uh, incomprehensible and others come forward and suddenly kind of, you know, make things so look so clear while they are not, right? So it's, it's a complex, it's a very complex event. And therefore, I myself, at this moment, identify at least two vectors that I think are important, but I'm sure there are more of them. But if indeed we need to identify at least two, we should think about inter-imperial vector uh, and Russia-Ukraine, which is colonial imperial vector. Right. And this same vector probably includes, uh, you know, Russian relation with its own colonized and occupied uh, nations, indigenous nations and other underdeveloped communities. Right. So there is a lot to say uh, about how certain state uses its resources or what it resourcifies for the war. So, but these two things, they are co-present and it's very important. So in the inter-imperial vector, of course, we have this process of the global redistribution of power, of shifting it here and there, uh, kind of searching for new leaders or, new, or dealing with certain new and old tensions. So, and that's where precisely what this, you know, uh, deterrence is happening. This mm -hmm. is all about certain negotiations because this system and which is this kind of a major capitalist information, fossil industry and whatnot uh, uh, system, it has to survive, right? So it's fighting for a new life. It's rebooting in the way, in the process as we see it. It's rebooting. It will survive. But then there is a much more dangerous dimension there. And unfortunately, Ukraine appeared to be the realm where uh, this bloodshed is happening. Is this precisely what this colonial imperial vector that has to do with kind of a number of things, uh, including, including identity? Because it's not only about, I mean, partly it's, of course, about uh, certain legacies, imperial legacies that were inherited by the Soviet Union and how the Soviet Union built the relation with the republics, including there, uh, which was very much um, imperial relation, right? But it also has to do with, with this kind of thing that, that did not, mentioned that often because it, it sounds a little kind of almost mystical or whatnot or and we don't like this identity politics but it does have to do uh, it does tell us something very interesting about identities so with all this entire you know uh cultural appropriation that has been happening for so long time right so with uh, the russian state uh, imagining like certain meanings of, of being Russian that are kind of rooted in the Kievan Rus. So in a certain way, Ukraine is an obstacle for that identity that the Russian state is now is fighting for, right? So because we are, they cannot be in the way how they say they are. And that, would, you know, again, I don't want to go more into this mythology and etc. But these are certain mechanisms that kind of call for more accurate readings, maybe through certain, again, geopolitical from geopolitical to cultural and psychoanalytic theories, right? But when I think about this uh, eagerness to destroy and all our cultural objects, museums, libraries, everything in, in the occupied territories and those territories that are being shelled, it also for me relates to what this particular thing that myself I cannot clearly even articulate 
it's a destruction of evidence. It's a destruction of cultural evidence of you like of, of existence of Ukrainian culture. So in a certain way, you know, this it, it also belongs to uh, um, uh, with this dimension of imperial, colonial imperial dimension, which is very much present. So there is nothing, nothing of proxy there, right? So one is with this identity culture, etc. Then there is more pragmatic things: uh, the industry, right? So the atomic industry, the industry that was kind of conceived with the idea that it belongs to Moscow center, it was imagined as coordinated from there. And suddenly it became part of, you know, become fragmented and and, uh, belongs to other independent states. It's it's the the major trauma. So these things, uh, the Russian state also resolves for itself by this war. And that's why, again, there is nothing of proxy. It, we are not an addition. In a certain way, we are the central realm of, of this war. But at the same time, I say there are several centers. They're all present. And uh, that's how this war is overdetermined. And this complexity should not be uh, overlooked. Okay. Svetlana, thank you very much. We have to leave it here. And let's continue our collaboration with uh, the diaries and many other things and uh, this dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Geert, and everyone who is... democratized, they are everywhere, and they're re- delivering incredible images, but also incredible dis- destruction, right? But it's at the same time uh, trash technology, very strange. It's true, and I, again, uh, I'm looking forward to reading more in-depth research 
on the scale of kind of also the dimensions of these drone technologies because in, indeed they are some incredibly simple and like this tiny small you know photo drones mm. that are that were tricked in a little bit with little changes they were adapted to the war right so and then you have very complex technology and then you have kind of technology from abroad uh, which also brings very interesting question of what kind of details composed it and usually it's not just Iranian but actually Canadian American and what not right <laughs> so true. they are completely international produce even though if they come from Iran and then you have Ukrainian drones which are kind of this whole industry sort of bumped incredibly uh, and uh, sort of uh, participates like I just was listening today a certain podcast about uh, how drones fit with different software how they all come to certain mapping platforms how our military access or mapping platforms etc and these are you know all, all of these are kind of tiny units that kind of come with a very complex assemblage but at the same time they're all sort of independent and there are certain layers it's almost like stack <laughs> yes of stack. course yeah of, of all those things so um yeah and uh, the information about it is still kind of scarce but it's definitely something that i've been uh, looking at all the time um to understand better to know how it works to imagine I, uh, kind of spatial different yeah. story <laughs> from the ukrainian commanders who were very grateful that Ukrainian citizens donated them consumer drones. And they, mm -hmm. they said, you know, in the battlefield, these donations made a cruel, crucial difference. Yeah. And that is strange because... Yeah. It's, Th that's it's precisely, that's precisely beca because drones have become uh, and, and and what they can deliver, uh, what they enable uh, the armies, they became a crucial element of this war because they became they became the vision and because of this lack of uh, weapons, what as I say, uh, the emphasis is made on this. So whenever you speak to people in Kyiv or someone else, you would also hear that people uh, work for aerial intelligence. <laughs> And uh, they are part of territorial defense group or other groups or something else. But the number of people I suddenly discover who engaged in that is huge. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, almost uh, grassroots kind of mobilization of users who are doing aerial intelligence. Thank you very much. Hi. We're going to wrap up here in Amsterdam. Uh, thanks uh, to everybody, Matilda, Ray, Ray, Tommaso, and of course all uh, of you on the Krakow side and wherever you are in the world please join us create many many notes and um, open up the channels see you next time
że było mnie dobrze słychać, kiedy mówiłem to, o czym mówiłem uh, in my broken English. Uh, Gram Group uh, is ready, clip uh, by Gleb uh, is ready. Uh, wanna say something about the clip? <coughs> so, in these really difficult times, when our minds are so overfilled with information, emotions, and the most strange feelings, we have to remember that our mind is our engine and we have to keep it clean. So never forget to make your mind disinfection. Important and useful, I think. Especially for me after this winter hour, so more.
Słuchajcie, chyba jesteśmy. Uh, which language? Uh, cześć. No, We can mix. We can po polsku. Możemy miksować, Miksamy. wydaje mi się. Nie? To tak, hybridity. Uh, bardzo dziękuję, że jesteście. Uh, I niesamowity projekt zrobiliście. I uh, on, wydaje mi się, że tutaj też w tej wersji jakoś tak się uh, dobrze odnalazł. Wyszła naprawdę dobra aranżać z tym Cube'em i z tymi czterema projekcjami. No i tu udało się też umieścić w tym Lightboxie jakoś, jakoś inaczej na nich zobaczyć. Dla mnie udało się naprawdę. Czy my rozmawiamy teraz o tym, czy teraz oglądamy... Oprowadźcie może, zróbcie takie po prostu oprowadzenie, a potem jeszcze porozmawiamy może... E, tak, ja bym chciała zacząć oprowadzenie tylko w języku ukraińskim dla naszej audytorii. E, e, Mnie zdaje się, że da, dziękuję Ukraina TV za zaproszenie i zaraz u nas czytowanie 24 godziny. My przeżywamy rocznicę pełnomasztabnej e, ataki na terytorium Ukrainy e, razem z naszymi drużami i kolegami. І саме ця інсталяція, я думала, що ми могли б зачати з такого невеликого ритуалу, оскільки ритуал – це частина нашого проєкту теж, перформанс, який ми побачимо. І ці скульптури, які ми бачимо, ми можемо зарядити на перемогу України. Я можу показати взагалі, що це таке. Це мішок мішок на трупи. І всередині знаходяться рештки загиблих, мертвих загарбників. Ми вирішили їх увіковічити, зробити такий собі сувенір всім на пам'ять. Ну і це теж пам'ять про цю війну. Влад, ти пам'ятаєш рік тому, як почалася ця війна? Так, я думаю, всі добре це пам'ятають. У мене це був дивний досвід якогось відторження. Я прокинувся від того, що моя дівчина мене будуть зі словами «бомблять». А я їй кажу, типу, навіщо ти мене розбудила? Це дуже дивна реакція, яку я не одразу зрозумів, можливо, навіть досі до кінця не розумію. Але мені здається, це була реакція відторжнення, і я хотів просто в той момент заснути і прокинутись без цього, ніякого початку війни, нічого, просто щоб все було сном. Але я більше не заснув, і тримтить зараз всередині, як тримтіло тоді, і весь день просто ще треба було працювати на ногах, я робив якусь таску, а просто далі ходив і писав людям, як ви, що ви, збирав в групи всіх близьких, знайомих, друзів, питаючи, чи все у вас нормально. Це просто жахливий досвід, якого я не побажав би нікому. І сподіваюсь, що як найшвидше все це закінчиться, і прийде новий контекст, контекст миру і адекватного розвитку суспільства в якому люди не будуть прокидатися вранку, від, вранці від таких слів, від дівчини, близьких, кого завгодно, від просто смс в телеграмі, чи де б то не було. Я... О, це, це треш. Ну і так, вже якби рік цієї війни, і ми бачимо, що вона приносить, звичайно, як і описано було, руйнування і смерть, але ми намагаємося пропрацювати цю травму, Через мистецтво і е, людина, ідея, якби які прийшла ідея створення цих е, мішків з мертвими російськими солдатами е, в формі таких фігурок порцелянових, які стоятимуть на пам'ять у кожного і кожної українки і українця зараз з нами. І е, теж може скажи, як ця ідея тобі прийшла в голову. Ну як прийшла? Прийшла разом з війною вона прийшла, як не прикро це казати, але 
Але мені більше прийшла ідея увіковічити те, що буде з тими, хто до нас прийшов, з тими, хто ну, не хоче жити по укладам цивілізованого світу для тих, хто мислить, що в 21 столітті можна вести загарбницькі війни. Я хотів увіковічити їх не як героїв, не як пам'ять про щось позитивне. Я хотів увіковічити пам'ять негативних вчинків, негативних дій, негативного ставлення до суспільства, до особистості, до... Увіковічити той негативний опит і той продукт, який продукує тоталітаризм і авторитаризм насправді, де рішення одного впливають на життя всіх, але відповідальності він за це не несе і не відчуває жодної провини за ці смерті. Хотілося увіковічити більше такі речі. Ну так, і мені здається, що ця інсталяція, да, цей клуб разом з таким постаментом, де ми можемо дивитися на цих мертвих солдат, запакованих в мішки, без розпізнавальних знаків і обличчя, да, така дегуманізація, яка якби, привела, до якої призвела, призвели дії диктатора. Якби тут відчувається така тривожність, да, Трохи ми бачимо відео зруйнованої техніки, ми бачимо зруйновані будинки, ми бачимо демона смерті, ми бачимо мішки з трупами. І зараз я пропоную нам з вами зробити невеликий ритуал, зарядити їх на перемогу України. А потім ми могли би подивитися частину перформансу, який буде ритуалом на відкритті виставки.
czy jesteśmy? Jesteśmy. Jesteśmy z Gram Group w poszerzonym składzie, tak? tak, tak. <laughs> Ten projekt jest... Kiedy go zobaczyłem, kiedy mnie oprowadziłaś na wystawie, był dla mnie takim momentem kompletnego jakby wytrącenia porządków, w których się poruszam, albo może poruszamy właśnie kulturowo gdzieś tutaj, patrząc bardziej na zachód, gracie w jakiś sposób, nie wiem, na nosie dwóch imperializmów, i chińskiego, i, i rosyjskiego oczywiście. Tak wyszło przypadkiem, ale jest w tym no, coś niesamowicie takiego pff, trafionego. Opowiedzcie właśnie o tych, jakby, o tych inspiracjach. Cześć. Tak, w składzie powiększonym, bo dzisiaj taki dzień, że czujemy potrzebę spędzać ten dzień razem z przyjaciółmi, bliskimi ludźmi, z rodziną, tak. I tak jak my tutaj na przykład i Wład jest naszą też bliską osobą. Można Antigo, no byłoby lepiej by się ciuli w tym. <grych> ja sobie pozwolę w takim razie zaczytać urywek, kawałek tekstu kuratorskiego, który napisał Bogumił Książek. On w takiej w formie bardziej akademickiej pomoże nam zrozumieć, o czym chodzi dla naszej audytorii, która jeszcze nie wie o tym projekcie. Teraz twórcy postanawiają skupić się w większym stopniu na osobie wroga, a konkretnie jego zdezaktualizowanej postaci. Ponieważ z czego coraz bardziej w miarę postępującej wojny możemy sobie zadawać sprawę w tym konflikcie martwy wrog przestaje być wrogiem. Co więcej, w wyniku komunikacji zgonów następuje zmiana jakościowa. Martwa armia, ginąc, przechodzi do dwójnasób na drugą stronę, stając się dla Moskwy żywotnym problemem. Fani i Denis za pomocą paraleli między chińską magią i praktyką funeralną, współczesnymi praktykami funeralnymi dzisiejszej armii rosyjskiej, skrywując uwagę na katastrofy Moskwy w sferze duchowności bojowej, morale ukraińską moralny duch, wojenski duch rosyjską. I stawiam po raz kolejny pytanie o sens rosyjskiej agresji. No tak, bardzo akademiczny tekst. <grym> Tym razem ja już zamyślę się troszeczkę na chwilę. No, ale o tej magii chińskiej naprawdę też przypadkiem tak wyszło i nie przypadkiem, bo jak powstał ten pomysł, to ja szukałem troszeczkę tego imperializmu w chińskiej historii i w czasach, kiedy była stworzona armia Terakotowa, terakot, armia, tak? On po polsku będzie. I wtedy też znalazłem taki paralel, że wtedy było, coś jeszcze nie tam, 300 lat byli jakieś tam walki u nich, wojny, wojny, wojny i był u nich deficyt ludzi i dlatego zamienili tych żołnierzy żywych na ich statuje i zrobili tam terakotowe wojsko, bo nie było tyle ludzi, bo była taka praktyka, że pogrzeb był razem z jakąś tam ekipą, coś tam, koni, ludzi, jakieś tam nie wiem, złoto, kamienie. I w tym momencie nas już prawie 9 miliardów, teraz nie ma takiego deficytu i w tym taka paralel, ale odwrotnie, odwrotnie troszeczkę, że teraz Rosja może używać ile, ile chce ludzi i nie liczyć ich, bo nie ma deficytu ludzi, jakby my idziemy takim szlakiem teraz więcej jakby Następ więcej, więcej, więcej za krótki czas. No i imperialisty nie myślą o tym, żeby liczyć tych ludzi. 
No tak, ja bym chciała jeszcze dodać, że gadamy teraz, widzimy tą wojnę w ogóle jako koniec epoki imperializmu rosyjskiego, i więc teraz idzie ten proces dekolonizacji dla Ukrainy, który dla nas powstaje przez nacjonalizm, tylko tu są takie no jakby nowe formy, ale teraz pojęcie języka ukraińskiego, ukraińskiej nacji bardzo jest ważliwe dla identyczności tych osób, które bronią swój dom, więc mamy taki trochę proces odwrotny, więc koniec Imperii Rosyjskiej i, i, walka za, i walka za swoją identyczność. I w tym projekcie my myśleli, że nie chcemy teraz gadać o identyczności ukraińskiej, bo ten, to jakby dla nas teraz wszystkich zrozumiało, że ten flag na przykład na mojej twarzy mówi o tym, że teraz dla nas jednym ideą jest nasz stan, nasza mowa i, i nasza społeczność. Um, ale chcieli po, zobaczyć i pokazać, jak koniec tego imperializmu nastaje. I przez te ofiary wojny, przez tą masę biologiczną, która jest wysyłana na tereny Ukrainy jako masa biologiczna i nie jest przyjmowana jako identyczność. My w tym nie widzimy identyczności rosyjskiej, a widzimy tylko tą masę. Powstał taki pomysł i Denis ma doświadczenia, on pracował patologiem kiedyś w szpitalu, więc dobrze zna formy tych worków jak wygląda to ciało i kiedy zaczęliśmy oglądać pierwsze wiadomości, pierwsze zdjęcia z tego miejsca, ten, ta idea, on mi o niej powiedział, że, że myślę, że będziemy gadać akurat o tym, o, o śmierci przez, przez taką masę, bo on, Denis mi mówił kiedyś, że można poczuć, jak energia wychodzi z martwego ciała. Tak, ostatnie trzy dni. No to trochę mistycznie, ale ja póki pracowałem z ludzkim ciałem, to odczuwałem to naprawdę. On, tam jest ta energia, ta, on, cieplej, zimniej staje, zmienia kolor. No ona jeszcze, to ciało jeszcze żyje po śmierci. Jak nie ma już świadomości, to jest jeszcze ta energetyka i to naprawdę to, co oni tam leżą, leżeli w Ukrainie, nie wiem jak tam teraz. Ale to, co widziałem na początku po zdjęciach, że był, byli rozrzucione te ciała po całych terenach i po tym, jak zbierali też, oni potem gdzieś czekali w jakichś refrigeratorach albo jeszcze gdzieś, jeszcze gdzieś, no to, to jakby do, do pogrzebu oni byli w tej formie tego worku, gdzie oni byli umieszczeni, no i o tym to jakby taka też była część przedłużenia ich istnięcie, na mój wzgląd, w tych workach, no i dlatego też wybrałem tą formę i ten, ten sposób. Okay. No i o pogrzebie, te praktyki funeralne w naszej sztuce powstają nie pierwszy raz, więc... My kiedyś pracowali razem. Yeah, this is why we, we like to we like to be together and to discuss art together with Antigona because there's something yeah something similar. No i tak i te praktyki funeralne, więc wcześniej robiliśmy kilka projektów w ogóle o śmierci i był jeden taki o Cieszyńskiej i ja tam zrobiłam pogrzeb budynku, więc pamiętam od kiedy była dzieckiem. Moja babcia często chodziła na pogrzeby swoich starych przyjaciół i przyjaciół, którzy już nie żyli. No i ja spędzałam z nią czas i coś tam złapałam tą magię i mi podobało się, że wszyscy wiedzieli o czym chodzi. W sensie, że każda osoba, która przychodzi wie, że na tym miejscu stoją te, przynoszą takie kwiaty, teraz będzie śpiew, potem będzie choda i tak dalej. I to była taka choreografia jakiegoś eventu, która, która mi bardzo spodobała się. I kiedy zaczęła robić praktyki performatywne, zrozumiała, że to, był, to była taka pierwsza praktyka performatywna, którą poznałam. No i tu na tym performencie właśnie, który widzieli się kawałek i też tam jest na tej ścianie. Ja jestem taką postacią duchu śmierci lub duchu wojny. 
Zrobili my taki make-up, makijaż, który nazywa się face painting, jako rodzaj body painting, body art, a tylko na twarzy jest taki zespół super, Marian Folge i jego studenci, którzy robią takie rzeczy. I my wymyślili sobie taką maskę chińską z tego starego teatru, więc pokazać tą funeralną praktykę chińską, o tyle, że chodzi o tej armii terakotowej. Tylko duch tej śmierci i wojny zawsze przychodzi w różnych takich postaciach. Teraz my jesteśmy w tym 2022-2023 roku. No i ja pokazywałam ten proces, już trzecim, tak, ja pokazywałam ten proces przerabiania na ten biomateriał, więc jak, jak z osoby żyjącej oni są przetworzone na te, na te worki. No i z jednej strony nie zrobiłam takiego pochowania tym żołnierzom, ale z drugiej strony o, jestem humanistką i myślę, że ten, ten przechód, ten, te wejście energii żyjącej w inny świat potrzebuje przewodnika i ja w tym występowała jako taki przewodnik, ten taki duch. Czyli jest tam jakiś rodzaj e, litości, e, bo... Bo, bo e, też można to interpretować jako, bo to ma potencjalną kontynuację, nie? To się, e, te małe obiekty, te małe worki, one, one tak uprzedmiotawiają. E, it's a de, <laughs> subject, the subjectification of, a, it's a, like a gadget. It's like something you can buy, sell, you can collect, you can give to somebody like a gift. And uh, uh, I don't know, <coughs> is it part of this? Uh, uh, like a future of the project? Uh, what do you think about? Uh, 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 okay, I can answer in English as well. Uh, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, as I said, this ethical aspect is very important to me because I knew that uh, we would like to monetize <laughs> the the sculptures that we have. Uh, we specially uh, designed it uh, with the size that it can be fit in in hand. And uh, I saw uh, at the entrance you also have these ceramic sculptures that are uh, sold on uh, fleet markets. And like when you're entering uh, an apartment of uh, someone, like an old lady, you can see those little ceramic uh, statues. The, at, the, at the entrance? No, 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 no. Uh, you will tell, okay. No. Ah. Yeah, that's uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah. We're talking about uh, yeah because it's a, it's a link. Uh, I didn't recognize actually. I put it there. <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. She bring it uh, from. Uh, uh, I bring bring it uh, from Gostomel. Uh, when I was in the summer, I uh, shoot there and uh, film uh, Lost and Freedom and. Uh, um, we was in total, totally destroyed building and destroyed apartment. Everything was on fire, and uh, everything was dead. And um, uh, we found there this two sculpture, also ceramic sculpture, but uh, uh, and the photo of um, very little boy. Um, I don't know, it's something, um, um, if there's something uh, uh, the same uh, and um, depends uh, uh, of one to the another, but for me it was like uh, a symbol of uh, our children of our beautiful creatures which unfortunately destroyed by Russia, by occupants, by these enemies and uh, it's very terrible to feel and see this, how it's very fragile and beautiful uh, can be destroyed and uh, 
Uh, in the other side, uh, which create a gram group, it's uh, the same sculpture, also very fragile, very beautiful, uh, very um, magic and very interesting by forms, but uh, sp they have uh, totally another meanings and totally another um, difference at that it's um, that body of Russia's. So how uh, they could do this to us to make this uh, project like to I, uh, everybody I think <laughs> wanted to have, uh, will, will want it or want wanting to have this um, sculpture like a reliquia because everybody has so big suffering, uh, so big trauma, so big uh, tragedy in their life. So um, now um, all the world's um, different. We um, happy about the death. And we wish to have this um, symbol in our houses. It's, um, it's madness, but it's true. And it's not our true. It's their true. Unfortunately, we uh, must to understand um, how crew uh, can be um, our brothers, <laughs> like they say. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. Uh, I have one question, but uh, or maybe kind of a reflection. I switch to English uh, in a moment. Uh, uh, in the same time, I started in Polish because I, I wanted to be like more in this region, also in the re um, language level. Uh, but uh, uh, this is kind of the reflection or question to you, uh, all of you, in a way, about the relation to, to death and about like uh, what I recognize like uh, more brave, more direct. Uh, of course, the context of war, uh, it's uh, something what uh, uh, changed uh, so much, but not only. The war didn't start a year ago. Yeah, the war started... Uh, <laughs> nine. <laughs> nine. Nine, actually, nine years ago. And, uh, but in the same time, I think, it, like in general, there is something like a transition uh, uh, and uh, like a delicate uh, difference uh, that in the this old Western uh, cultures, this old democracies, death that body is invisible. Death is more and more invisible, and uh, this is uh, what is changing now. Uh, because the media, because, uh, but I think you are like, uh, you can uh, teach us to be like a more brave uh, in front of this. I, I see this like daily, uh, talking about war or asking about what that means, uh, what means this fear. Mm -hmm. że no tak, tak jakby in, in, tak, i, my s, mam wrażenie, że w Polsce też coraz bardziej e, jakby przyzwyczajamy się do tej niewidzialności śmierci e, wypracowanej na zachodzie. Nie? E, tak, taki właśnie komfort, dystans, e, a tu się mocno zmienia rzeczywistość. E, ten i te i to, co się teraz dzieje, taki wstrząs, który tutaj też ludzie odczuwają bardzo, bardzo mocno, jest czasami, mam wrażenie, nie do przejścia po tej właśnie edukacji niewidzialności śmierci przez przynajmniej chyba kilka generacji, nie? Bo to trzeba było uciąć bardzo szybko traumy II wojny światowej i no. Um. 
Yeah, I'll uh, start and speak in English. Um, uh, I I just want to say uh, that it's kind of crazy. Uh, you are just facing the death every day and uh, you are getting used to it and uh, it's uh, like you have to live with it every day and you're getting used to something that you could uh, not even imagine before like and uh, moreover you need to live with this constant hate that you feel toward this uh, occupying nation that started the war like you are living every day with the face of the death with this crazy hate and you have to take it and bury it inside of you uh, and yeah the lives uh, the life uh, becomes harder you need to survive every day not to fall into this trap of uh, depression and uh, and like you have to you, you struggle you struggle every day uh, but this makes you more brave it makes you feel the life uh, more and more in the way you didn't think you can and you didn't want before and uh, yeah it's a constant struggle you uh, and you're getting used to it and it's the worst thing like I, 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 I don't advise to anyone to feel the same uh, but still if you want to live you have to uh, discover this infragility inside of yourself and just go forward not thinking about tomorrow like maybe some in some way just if you want but still living today and striving and like you just try to live and be brave uh, not taking into consideration everything that happens around you in your native and your home country and uh, it's strange okay uh. Um, I can also add that um, for me um, I like that you mentioned this uh, like you know the ban on death uh, I think that death in Western society also became like this uh, taboo banned uh, uh, subject uh, same as uh, pornography sexual orientation and uh, like any any extreme forms uh, of, uh, of of human like of human self-expression are are considered as dangerous and I think that uh, death can be represented only in one special way you know like with the respect uh, on special day in with, with, with the special clothes <laughs> there is this dark black color that is dedicated so everything is according to the you know to the to the ritual like to them to this um, thing and it, it we shouldn't talk about it uh, that much you know maybe with with psychologists and shrinks and that's it but uh, I see it a bit different. It's a very natural process generally, you know, the, the death itself, the transition from, from, from the living world to the world uh, uh, to the other one. I do believe that there is one. Um, so uh, thinking about it, talking about it, because of course it's related to the grief, to negative emotions, if we can say negative, to like strong emotions and uh, uh, through art practices, I think uh, it, uh, uh, the subject uh, uh, stops being tabooed and uh, like we bring it to the, to the social discourse uh, like through, through this art project. So first of all, we wanted each Ukrainian to have a dead Russian body at their house. <laughs> you know, you can smash it, you can keep it as a memory, not to repeat it like whatever whatsoever like it's like you know like a souvenir that can be there to show the, like the hatred of the nation that is that is um, betrayed uh, but also on the other hand we have to you know see this content these photos every day on social networks we talk with parents who tell us that they see these evidences on the street and through this uh, uh, like creativity working with clay putting you know uh, the glaze on it uh, we also use it as you know artistic practices and when we do the exhibition we bring it to the 
it's a public discourse, so people can actually talk about uh, death, what, what they feel, what it means, uh, no matter which war we are mentioning, this or another one. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much. Uh, bardzo wam dziękuję za ten projekt, za to, że przyszliście, że przyjęliście zaproszenie i też wam dziękuję za wspólne początki Ukraina TV jeszcze raz, bo to też trochę taka symboliczna e, sytuacja, że po roku e, jesteśmy tutaj i też inne osoby, które e, były wtedy bliżej. rok będzie. Za chwilę Ukraina TV też będzie już rok i to czas leci. Również dziękujemy za zaproszenie. Kiedy ty napisał, ja myślałam, że akurat z wami chcemy spędzić ten dzień. Zaprosiłam też władę i cieszę się, że jest Antigona. No i wy jesteście naszą taką community, z którymi my w ten dzień czujemy się bezpiecznie i, i, i możemy o tym tak i blisko. Proponuję trochę jeszcze zobaczyć ten performance na koniec, żeby nas odpuścić. Tak, bardzo wam dziękuję. Was już wypuszczamy. Natomiast Antigona to dla wszystkich was tutaj i dla wszystkich osób, które nas słuchają, oglądają. Około 20, about 8 o'clock, yeah? your performance will be here. I think something radical and... Uh, I don't know, want to say something about this or leave us... Uh, Waiting. I am uh, inspired by um, Dan and Fanny very much um, when I just first uh, uh, saw it. Uh, and uh, my also what you say that uh, I work uh, with death and sexuality, uh, it's my topics, and um, I um, will be. Uh, um, will be showing um, a Russia which um, lives her life. I try to show it like um, all what I understand about it. So it will be radical and uh, I think um, it will be very um, um, hard <laughs> but in the other side will be happy end, like with uh, that sculpture of uh, that, that body and beautiful sculpture of that. Yeah, we actually start uh, at the beginning of this project uh, uh, with the investigation in uh, archaeology, but uh, from uh, Ukraine, uh, actually, about uh, uh, Olmia, about uh, Orphic uh, rituals uh, and circulation between life and death, life and death, and that's uh, inscription uh, uh, from uh, <coughs> period like pre-Homeric uh, uh, period and uh, um, archaeological investigations from uh, Kherson region and uh, that's where Europe actually starts. Uh, police, uh, the city, this uh, community conception, and uh, Dionysia and uh, Orphic rituals. <coughs> exactly about this, uh, about uh, the circulation and uh, overthinking this or, um, or overwork because the thinking is. Uh, to less, not uh, enough. Uh, I think it's something about body, f about psychophysical, and uh, not a level thinking uh, about. Uh, yeah, that's thanks. And push the door.
Compared to others, your ranking is low. This one? This one? No, this one. Compared to others, your ranking is low. This makes you sad. This makes you sad. This makes you sad. Wiping finger is tired and we have to stop. Others are supposed to move us to arouse us. This makes you sad. And yet we don't do anything anymore. This makes you sad.
kissing you from inside. They don't have any plan. Doesn't matter. Cause it's illusion of choice.
na czekanie. Znowu troszeczkę historii Ukraina TV. Jeden z pierwszych afirów, DJ Charlie. Nie trzeba nic dodawać. Pozdrawiamy. Dole. Thank you. 
69 to avoid doing my part If I look at you, I'll finish you before you even start I'm a kitty girl, pretty girl, bestest in the world If you look up on my breast, a silver diamond's really good Bestest in your third I'll clean you up nicely Don't wait for you go to work I love it when you do all the work I'm a princess Happy I don't wanna go to work I love it when you do all the work I'm a princess Love it when you do 
1250, press return.
очень просто, когда человек растет, у него в душе происходит три процесса. Первый это накопление информации. Как ты мог заметить, взрослый человек знает десятки раз больше, чем ребенок, хотя ни один взрослый не знает всего. Второе это созревание души и сердца, развитие умения любить, прощать, строить отношения с другими людьми. Третий процесс это созревание ответственности. Сейчас ты ребенок, если ты сделал какую-нибудь глупость, мы тебя пожурим или накажем, но ты не будешь нести этот груз всю жизнь, потому что за тебя отвечают твои родители, а взрослый, в отличие от ребенка, сам отвечает за свои поступки, ему некого обвинить. Если что-то идет не так, в его жизни наперекосяк. Так вот, вернемся к первому процессу накопления знаний. Этот процесс может идти тремя способами. Первый способ пользуются дети в селах и в неблагополучных семьях. Они общаются с несколькими своими приятелями по соседству и родителями, обычно не особенно учеными. Вся информация берется из их круга, немного информации из не высшего качества дают телевизор. Люди, которые больше ценят эту часть созревания, идут вторым путем, учатся в хорошей школе, потом в институте. Они получают знания у более широкого круга опытных и умных людей. Но максимум, скольких людей ты можешь учиться в школе? 20-50. А когда ты читаешь книжки, ты учишься у всех поколений, которые были до тебя. Книги пишут примерно последние три с половиной тысячи лет. За это время на Земле сменились 10 тысяч поколений. Если ты полюбишь читать, это даст тебе возможность учиться не у 20 человек, а у миллионов. Лучших из лучших. Oh, oh, oh. 